at least you're not contributing to load shedding. You are on mute, Prof. <laughs> you are on mute. I've been muted by uh, by yourselves. So, uh, good morning, uh, comrade. Morning, uh, morning, Prof. I'm 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 impressed that you're not contributing to load shedding, hey? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I try to save load shedding. Are you guys, is parliament still on at the moment? Or are you on recess? We're on recess, but we are inundated with work. So we... we you are forced to work during recess. Okay. okay. Ketesi to you, Prof. <laughs> 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 we can only try, you know, our country is in really in difficulties. I think we're just uh, Say that again, Prof, but we'll survive. <laughs> It's just, uh, yeah, nothing seems to go right. Yeah. By the grace of God, though, we remain faithful that one day we'll weather the storm. Yeah, I think I think we will come out of it. Um, um, good morning. Uh, oh, Kulego. Uh, Finally, Chepesin. Good morning. <laughs> morning, morning big. There was an urgent which needed my, my attention, and I apologize. Uh, we generally and always keep time here in this committee, um, so I, I apologize for um, this five-minute delay on, on my part. I would like to, as a story put, Ben, are we good to go with all members present? Uh, yes, it's so that quite can... a couple. Let me check who's not here. But, um... Are we good to go? Yes, Chair. All right. Well, that is fine. Let me take this opportunity <clears throat> and welcome you colleagues um, to our meeting this morning with ESCOM. And um, I am advised that the uh, Minister and Deputy Minister and Acting DG and other senior officials of the department are present. The board chairperson, Present Uprof and uh, board members as well. And um, the executives are led by the CEO. And there's quite a number of executives present and senior managers um, uh, here this morning. And I hope that uh, uh, Ms. Natasha Stolle uh, has been assisted with uh, being a co host. But our meeting is two parts this morning, so as we welcome um, DPE and ESCOM, uh, we're first going to deal with um, the Semenya report, um, which is going to be presented to us this morning uh, from now until 10. And then we will start with the hearing into the deviations and expansions. So Honorable Mende and Honorable Tolasha, you will stand by for that. Um, and then we will proceed in that fashion. Then there are matters which Honorable Hadeb and Honorable Van Minen are also focusing on. Uh, today is a packed day. We'll, we will deal with their matters in the next uh, hearing. So colleagues, because I've already delayed you by five minutes, let me I request that I hand over to the minister. Sister Put Ben, uh, please uh, enter the apologies into the record accordingly. Um, and then, uh, Minister, if there are any uh, opening remarks you'd want to make, 
uh, I'll give you that opportunity. Recording and in then progress. Request, uh, <clears throat> the chairperson of the board, uh, Uprof, uh, to then make the presentation on the uh, Semenya report. So I think colleagues, that's in order um, because that report must be tabled uh, here formally first before we engage it. So Minister, I'll hand over to you and then Prof, you will take the platform um, and then we'll be in your capable hands. Colleagues, good morning. Welcome, Minister, over to you. Good morning, Chair, and good morning to the honorable members. Uh, I, I don't have much to say, Chair, save that uh, the, the Chair and the ESCOM team will uh, manage uh, their presentations. Secondly, there might be some governance issues that you might run into, but uh, let's deal with them as you come to them. And then thirdly, Chair, approximately an hour on 15 minutes from now, I might have to excuse myself to join another important cabinet meeting uh, or cabinet related meeting. And then uh, I'll try and get back as soon as I can, if that's possible. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, all right, let us uh, then go. Thank you, Minister. Okay, let's go to um, the chairperson of the board and welcome him and the, his colleagues in the board. Um, and then they will present to us. Um, and then hopefully uh, we will deal with those governance issues that we will run into uh, as the minister has framed. All right, Bob, over to you. Yeah. Th thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, members of the committee and my colleagues from ESCOM and uh, uh, the Honorable Minister, the Deputy and the Acting DG. Uh, it is my privilege, I think, to finally just uh, highlight uh, the report that was uh, conducted by Advocate uh, Ishmael Smenya. As you would recall from our last meeting, uh, it had been decided that uh, there were certain allegations that were proffered uh, that needed some investigation. And with the agreement of SCOPA uh, and the minister, it was agreed that the board be given an opportunity to conduct uh, these investigations into the allegations that were made uh, by the former uh, CPO, uh, Mr. Soli Chitangano. Um, terms of reference were drafted, and these terms of reference were drafted on the basis of the letters that had been sent to SCOPA and on the letter that had been sent to me uh, on the 16th of February 2020. Uh, there were other issues or other matters that had been raised that were already being investigated by the special investigation unit that could not really be formed part of the terms of reference. The terms of reference were shared uh, with the Department of uh, Public Enterprises and they were finally um, informed, forwarded to SCOPA and, uh, and uh, the investigation was commenced. Um, the report has been sent to SCOPA and I think it details, I think, some of the problems that uh, Advocate Zemenia had, I think, in trying to, to start the investigation. But uh, that's a matter of process. I think uh, finally it was overcome and uh, the process started. And a few people were interviewed, I think, in this process. I think uh, for two days, I think uh, Advocate Zemenia spent um, uh, talking and having discussions with uh, Mr. Chitangano. And, uh, and then after that, I think he interviewed the executive director of HR, uh, Ms. Pule uh, Elsie. And then he interviewed uh, the CEO, Mr. Andre Reiter. And I was uh, finally called and I submitted an affidavit that I had initially prepared for SCOPA, uh, I submitted it to him, detailing my understanding of what transpired, I think, in the whole thing. Uh, Advocate Semenya informed me right at the beginning that because there are three processes that were taking place at the time, it was his investigation, 
it was the disciplinary inquiry into 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 Mr. Ch Chitangano, and there were there were I think two court cases that were taking place that all revolved around uh, Econ Oil. He was really interested in keeping strictly to his terms of reference and not trying to go out of those terms of reference. So I made my own presentation and the, the report has been, um, has been released and it has been provided to all of you. I think what was uh, important was that uh, the major serious issue that had been driven through this report and through the media was the allegation of racism. And uh, clearly uh, the findings of uh, Advocate Semenya was that uh, there, were no, uh, there was no basis for such allegations. There was also, I think, uh, uh, allegations of uh, breach of, uh, I think, procedures and policies and undermining processes and undermining the board and so forth. And none of this could be substantiated in the investigation from what the advocates Mania presented. I have, however, wanted to, to make maybe two points uh, and just to use one illustration of, of this case and in this report. There was an allegation that uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Muton had been uh, appointed on a fixed term contract and this did not uh, follow procedure. And the allegations were that there was nepotism, patronage, and uh, an abuse of power. Now, first of all, as you know, for you to charge somebody that uh, there is nepotism, you must establish that there is a friendship between the two people and or else they are related to each other. And none of those could be found in relation to Mr. Andre and Mr. Mouton. Neither was Mr. Mouton a colleague of, uh, of, uh, of Andre. They were co-workers, but not colleagues. So I'm just uh, illustrating that as a, a very simple point. But also there were a lot of uh, inaccuracies in, the, in these al allegations that uh, I think we can go into, I think if needs be, but uh, there were lots of allegations from the, from, the, from the allegations. From the point of view of the letter that I had received, I think on the, on the 16th of uh, uh, February, 2020, I had actually investigated all these matters that were raised in that, and I had uh, come to the conclusion that these were not matters that required a board investigation, but they could be handled in internally through uh, the grievance processes of, of ESCOM. So I did not see any merit for them to be investigated. In fact, Advocate Semenya made that point that he is surprised that a matter as simple as this should require such a heavy handed uh, investigation. So as far as we are concerned, none of the allegations that Mr. Chitengano brought could be substantiated after Advocate Semenya conducted the, this investigation. And as I say, the report is there uh, clearing uh, Mr. Andre Tirator. And I think we should now put our attention to the tasks that uh, the GCE must do and focus on the task that ESCOM needs to do, which is to transform in a fundamental manner. And uh, I think uh, leave no stones and turn as the people normally say, but focus on a new culture, a high performance culture that is required at, uh, at ESCOM and stop, I think, using the race card as an excuse for anything that ever happens in an organization such as ESCOM. Because I think the, the expectation of the public about the mandate of ESCOM is too serious uh, to be left, I think, to these kinds of uh, what I call frivolous uh, complaints that were brought by our former CPO. I think I will stop there, but I'm quite happy to take questions because uh, I actually was interviewed by uh, Advocate Semenya and, and other people may chip in. But in essence, the investigation 
was conducted and uh, we we are honored that uh, Scopa gave us the opportunity to do this, to conduct this. And as I say, although Mr. Chitangano brought some other issues into as, as part of his allegations, most of those, if not all, were being already being investigated. In fact, he was not bringing them, but they were already there being investigated by the special uh, investigating unit in some of his complaints. So I will leave it there. And if uh, maybe the minister wants to make some comment or other people, I, and then I can take questions. Chair, I'm done. Have I? It looks like the chair has been disconnected, uh, honorable members. So, so who who steps in? All right, no, no, sorry, my oh, okay, uh, okay, okay, changing connection. Uh, okay, what, what? The other one was unstable, and I feared that it may interrupt me for the rest of the meeting. No, thank you very much, um, Prof. I, I changed it the t it, as you were concluding, okay. saying you will take. Christian. So I, I, I'm, I heard everything. All right, colleagues, um, let me hand over to you. Um, if there are any questions that you would like to, to pose to the board on this matter, so that we can then um, go into the hearing. Thank you, uh, Prof. Colleagues, over to you. Um, please indicate in the group. Honorable Mente. Thank you, Chair. Now, <clears throat> Chairperson, my earlier concern, which was registered before when, when we withdrew or rather postponed our own investigation into these matters, in particular the matters that were in relation to uh, expenditure framework and irregularities where PFMA and finance uh, regulations were flouted. That, um, that process, as much as we say we postponed to allow ESCOM to continue with its own investigation on the matter uh, pertaining to their internal issues, it's fine, it can be allowed. So their report is now concluded and it therefore means that we have to sit with their report, go through their terms of reference which from the beginning I have indicated that they have nothing to do with expenditure framework, PFMA and finance, uh, finance regulations as prescribed by the National Treasury. And therefore us as a committee, we still have to continue with our own investigation on the matters raised pertaining to these complaints. And the matters that are very serious, some of them they even find expression in the deviations that we are supposed to be dealing with today. Therefore, Chair, uh, I have no issue with their report. It's their ESCOM report. We'll continue with ours. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Mentor. Are there any other uh, comments? All right. Colleagues, uh, let, let, let's, let's do this. Um, I have gone through that uh, report that has been transmitted to us and there has been subsequent um, correspondence that I've also received. But uh, key amongst the issues was, uh, which on the record term, on my own interpretation, withdrawn because they were substantively and categorically said not to be the case. Um, so that was the first issue. Um, the second point, of course, as Honorable Mente correctly points out, is that the other matters of financial uh, management will form due part of the ordinary work that we do um, as a committee. Um, as we probe the, um, the reports, the presentations, and the financials, um, and so on. So that work is certainly not lost on us, uh, but uh, a hurdle has been cleared 
uh, now, and of course the AG is still going to audit. So, if 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 on our side we feel there are issues which have not been substantially dealt with in the financial management, we can always subject them with um, the AG as we ordinarily do um, on on other areas. Uh, the third issue, um, chairperson and the board. Uh, is that, <clears throat> as the prof will agree with me, and the point I have made uh, throughout uh, the uh, challenges that generally the country is faced with, is that my, as my late mother was a nurse used to say, prevention is better than cure. Step. The board should have dealt with these issues at the moment they had been raised. And because you will recall that it, when we, the issues landed on our desk, it transpired that 13 months or so, a reason. Because to keep them alive in one way or the other keeps the so I think as just as a rule of thumb, uh, urgency and expediency on key challenges and allegations must just dealt with and dispensed with because they become an albatross, they become, uh, my English fails me here, um, I'll find the word and I'll translate it later. It becomes a problem. A stumbling block, yes, some cock, right? That's the word I wanted. So I, I think, uh, colleagues, we can then uh, uh, say we we note the report uh, as presented, and we are receiving it formally now. It had been sent to us, and the chairperson, on behalf of the board, has sent it uh, to us and has presented it to us now. Uh, and honourable mentor is quite correct. Uh, we will deal with the substantive financial management areas. Uh, in the due process of work. So I think that leaves that matter there. Uh, for now, I'll hand over to the chair uh, for a concluding remark on this matter. And then Honorable Mente, uh, you will then kick off the hearing on TV. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I just want to to thank, I think, SCOPA for giving us as a board the opportunity, I think, to conduct this investigation. But I want to make just one point absolutely clear. Uh, Mr. Chitangano sent me a letter on the 16th of February in 2020. And within four days of that, on the 20th of February, I contacted him and I had close to about four or five interactions with him. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that this matter was not worth what it, how it was supposed to be resolved and requested that he and Mr. Andre De Reita should meet and conduct themselves as adults because they didn't know each other. So I think the notion that we spent 13 months and didn't do anything, uh, it's actually false. We did something but it didn't work out the way it should be. In fact, in his own presentation to Advocate Semenya, which he never said to Scopa, he, he intimated and indicated the number of in, in interactions that we had before the explosion that happened a year later. So I want, to, I want, the, I want Scopa to be rest assured that I did not sit on an urgent matter that had been raised by a former senior executive of ESCOM. Uh, and I think there is evidence to that effect. I presented that as an affidavit to advocate Smenya. And if uh, Scopa wants to have that, I can forward it to them. But we did something. Uh, other than that, uh, I agree with the chair that this uh, report should be noted. And uh, I think we move forward on the other issues that are pertinent to what you do in relation to the PFMA, the finance and the deviations, and we get on. Uh, and finally, I think, as I say, focus on what the mandate of ESCOM is in relation to its responsibility to the country, the economy, and the well-being of people. Thank you again.
Chairperson, Chairperson, Honorable Turks. Uh, um, yes. Chairperson, I didn't want to comment on, on this matter because I have my own views about it, yeah. but I wasn't going to comment. But uh, since the Chairperson now is raising the issue, can you hear me, Chair? Uh, yes, can you turn on your camera? Uh, we've been asked to um, on. No, Chair, I'll put, I'll, I can't put my camera on now. I'll put it on uh, when, I, when I speak later okay, on. This is, one, this is one point down to raise, Chair. Chair. Since the Chair now is raising the issue of of um, of that he, they did not do, uh, they did not sit down and do nothing. They have, uh, he has to, when there was interaction between uh, him and, and the Chief Procurement Officer, he then he said he, he, he asked him to refer to, to to the team and the Richter must sit down and speak about it. But uh, uh, I don't think that is the procedure. When the, the chief procurement officer submitted the complaint to the chair, the chair was supposed to table it at the board for the board to deal with the matter. The chair did not table it with the board. Now, you cannot follow, not follow proper procedure and then you say, no, we have done something. My understanding is that when the complaint came in, it was supposed to be have been tabled at the port so the port can deal with, with the matter which the port did not do and that was our our cry for the whole matter thank you chair i think uh, colleagues we have noted the report we're going to study the report and if there is the need for us to pursue it uh, any further, uh, we will, the issues of financial management remain squarely on the table for us uh, to deal with. We will still look at all the other matters. Um, and I, I note particular interpretation of the sequence of events uh, as well. Be that as it may, um, I'll request uh, that we proceed. Uh, Prof, I know your dilemma. Uh, Ugutse, every now and again, you, 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 you want to call me by my first name, and you are more than excused to do so because you are still my VC. So there's no problem there uh, at, 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 at all. All right. Honorable Mente, let us go to you uh, on the deviations, and then Honorable Tolasha, you will come in uh, on the expansions. Uh, colleagues, I assume we are all fine. Going once, going twice, going thrice, gone. All right, Honorable Mente, we are in your hands. Abulela Chair. Engos Gakulu Chairperson. Chair, the last meeting we had with ESCOM, there was um, wrong information that was provided before us. <coughs> which then led to us not continuing with the meeting. And there were specific requests that were made on that particular day as to, due to what we have received and according to the information as well received from National Treasury, which then becomes the source of information and triggered this whole response and the uh, uh, interaction we are having is that we must have all the information as per the National Treasury's uh, information provided to us. And that was agreed upon. So upon receiving the documentation and the information uh, from ESCOM, I became very much uncomfortable. They must then confirm what information they've provided to us on which information they did not provide to us. Because as far as I look into this chair, one, I am not sure if ever we do have the people who have signed all the letters requesting deviations. Yes, we do have the chairperson of the board here. And I assume we do have the group CE here. Do we have all the people that had signed the letters? But most importantly, their response to us, which is a guide to this particular hearing, is giving us, let's say, for instance, in the deviations, they are responding to six deviations. Yet, on their same information on page 30, they outline 
the number of deviations they have sent to National Treasury. They further outline what did National Treasury say to them as to what was supported, what was conditional, what was not supported. But when it comes to their narrative, they are giving us only six of that on quarter one and quarter two in terms of deviations and on expansions as well. They are giving us, I think about nine of them out of 46. So in that chair, I am very much uncomfortable with this. We cannot be dealing with the same information where we have outlined. Now we must clarify who is not uh, doing justice to this. Is it us and our back office or is it ESCOM? That is only telling us what we need to, what they want us to hear and not go further. And um, safe to indicate, Chair, that this is not a tick box exercise. This is getting into the investigation and understanding that which National Treasury indicated to us as irregularities that they actually prevented and not continuing in ESCO. Would love to go through the ones that they've given us, but I'm not in the, in, in the fashion of ticking a box of six ones and where there is outstanding ones. Chair, you will guide what should happen from now. Thank you. All right. Um, huh, that's a bit of a dilemma there. Um, okay, maybe Honorable to take us through um, in terms of the substantive issues of uh, so that ESCOM can respond directly. I know that um, there are about 30 deviations uh, at play and uh, the responses by ESCOM only deal with six, if I'm not mistaken, I am subject to correction. Um, so, but I think the chairperson and uh, the CEO have heard what you have said, and maybe they can respond to that first, and then we'll come back to you. So let's get a reaction um, to that. But um, I think if I'm summarizing you, summarizing you correctly, that's the issue you are pointing to. There is a list of um, the ESCOM delegation that has been sent. Um, so I would imagine that uh, those it's gone. No, nothing. The chair is gone. Now, my question was, uh, chairperson of the board, is is it deliberate that ESCOM is giving is responding only on six deviations instead of uh, eighteen deviations? Because okay. 11 were conditionally supported. We want to know out of those conditions, what's no. the progress thus far? Seven were not supported altogether. And why are we given only six instead of all 18? Thank you. Thank you, uh, right. Honorable Man. I, I was actually going to respond to that to ask, I think, uh, Mr. Andre Dereta to take you through and summarize, I think, the response that we are presenting today so that I think we can all speak from the same page, but the point you raise is important and I think it needs to be addressed. So I'll ask uh, the GCE to address your question frontally and not uh, evade it. Thank you. Andre. Well, good morning, honorable chair. Good morning, honorable members, members of the board, honorable minister uh, and officials. Um, in response to Honorable uh, Mente's question, the approach that we followed is to give the uh, committee uh, an overview of those deviations and expansions that were not approved. So, the, and this is in accordance with the custom that we followed in uh, previous submissions to the committee. 
so we don't deal with uh, conditional approvals. We don't deal with um, approvals that are still uh, awaiting a response from National Treasury. We've only dealt with those deviations and expansions that have not been approved uh, as they are um, likely to be cause for concern from the committee. However, if the committee wants us to provide them with a full explanation of all requests for expansions and deviations, including those that are still awaiting responses and that have in fact been approved, uh, we are obviously more than willing to do so. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, all right, uh, see, oh, uh, thanks, all right, I hear that. Um, I think the ones with the conditional support are important because we need to make a determination and an assessment as to whether there has been compliance with the conditions. So I think honorable mentor, that's the premise which you are moving from. I'm just going to give Honorable Mente a chance because she's leading this section of the hearing, colleagues. Okay. So you can just clear the woods uh, for the hearing. Honorable Mente. Uh, yes, Chair. I don't know whether it's my network or yours. I didn't capture your response very well. But um, I hear what the, 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 the GC is saying that they are providing what they have in their position and they are not on they are not um, considering the ones that were conditioned. They are only considering the ones that were not approved, which is very problematic for me because the ones that were conditioned by National Treasury, there is no hundred percent agreement there. And therefore, it cannot be correct that they cannot account for it. Let's make an example. If they were sourcing uh, anything or, 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 or uh, they were starting a project with Mkuleko Holdings and then National Treasury told them in January that no, you can continue with Mkuleko Holdings based on one, two, three, four, five. However, we'll allow you to continue with them for the next three months. Now it's in June. They should tell us what is happening with Mkuleko Holdings because we are now in June and therefore there has to be a new process that was a condition to them. Therefore, if we cannot be sitting here comfortably saying no, then the ones of condition are between yourself and National Treasury. We then render National Treasury's job useless by coming to us and telling us that we gave them these conditions and therefore we are not sure if they are following the conditions or not. We are now presenting this to you as Scopa to follow it up and see if our conditions were followed to the latter. So if we are now uh, saying there is a, there is a motion, or motion of no confidence to National Treasury to say, I, you told us something that you can deal with, we should say so. But to my understanding is that National Treasury brought this information to us, in particular the conditions that all those conditions should be followed. Failure in which to follow the conditions will lead to the termination of those contracts or the disagreement with National Treasury. And therefore we cannot be part and parcel of saying, no, we agree it's between you and National Treasury, which then will receive that information in a year's time next day when they are dealing with the matters of 2021-2022 uh, chain. So for me, I am not comfortable. We can't be dealing with six matters when we have 17 matters to be dealing with. And the six matters that we have before us are the ones that have answers which must be probed as well. And I don't have an issue going into those, but my problem is that we're going to lose the whole uh, investigation, if we split the investigation into two parts, where we deal with the six matters that they want to give us, and then we agree for ESCOM to come back with the remaining issues in six months' time. I don't know if I'm making sense, Chairperson. No, okay, no, I hear you. Uh, I, I am in full agreement with the notion. I hope I'm audible. I'm in full agreement with the notion that um, the 
deviations with conditions or conditional approval must be presented as well to make an assessment as to whether there is compliance with those conditions. So that is the, the agreement there. But I think uh, let's do this. Certainly, ESCOM is not going to come back in six months' time. Those others, no. uh, so that we dispense with some matters. Let's deal with the six. Let's probe it, um, and then we will be in discussion with ESCOM um, at the end of this meeting for uh, the earliest uh, mutually convenient date. Uh, and then we will we will move forward in that fashion. So let's deal with the six uh, honourable men, uh, which were not approved. And then the second leg will be the conditional approvals um, with the annual report in September, October, uh, month's time. I think we can establish that principle now that it's an outstanding matter. But in any case, honourable Van Union still has a ton load of issues she has to deal with the investigations. Um, which is something that needs to happen uh, as soon as our only constraint, of course, is that Parliament is in recess. Um, and so we are not meeting with the frequency during this time, which uh, uh, we would usually do. So can I beg your indulgence, Honorable Member, that proceed with the six and we'll dispense with those. Where there are overlaps, we will note those uh, and, and then come back to them. But let's probe these ones and see how far we go. All right, Honorable Mente, over to you. I'm sure ESCOM has noted that, and as the CEO had said that if um, the information will be provided. So ESCOM has noted that, that the conditional approvals will have to be processed by us as well. Thank you. Honorable Chair. Honorable Hatteb with an H. Well, thanks. I think just to add on what Honorable Mende is raising, I want to find out what was the brief to ESCOM? Did we indicate to them that they need to only respond to six or the request was for them to respond to all deviations? Because I find it strange that they will, um, in their own accord, decide what must be furnished to us. And I, I don't think from where I'm sitting, the brief was for them to respond to only six. I hear what you're proposing as the way forward, but here is the issue of principle and the information furnished to us that we cannot be dictated to what type of information should be consumed by us. I find it that unacceptable. Just to add on what um, Honorable Mentor is saying, we shouldn't create a, a perception or a situation whereby we are not furnished with full information and the assumption is created that this is not relevant to SCOPA. And if there were any issues of uh, misunderstanding, such request or clarity should, should have been sought from us. Because now we are on recess, coming back on the later stage. I view this as a deliberate attempt not to fully finish us with the information. And that cannot be accepted by this committee. No. Um... For lack of a better phrase, uh, there was no conditionality for the, for the deviations on our part. Uh, but what I'm trying to get at is we, we need to make uh, strides of progress uh, uh, so that this is what I'm saying I'm making the determination that the other deviations will be dealt with, not might uh, or what, there's no condition, they will be. And ESCOM is noting that, but I think the principle we're establishing, Honorable Hatebe, is spot on. It's correct. Chair, can I come in for a moment? Uh, yes, on, uh, yes, Honorable Minister. Well, so what I'm saying is that we will deal with those, um, um, those deviations, but may we proceed with the ones that are before us in whatever form or way now. Uh, and, and make right. Honorable Minister. Yeah, sorry, you faded off a little bit at the end, but thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I think your guidance is absolutely acceptable. 
Uh, and secondly, uh, on behalf of the ESCOM board and executives, I must say that any um, insinuation that there is a deliberate withholding of information would be incorrect and inappropriate. But we'll take your guidance. Uh, there must have been some misunderstanding about what exactly is required. Uh, but all of the information required by SCOPA will, at some stage or the other, according to your guidance, uh, be placed before SCOPA. There's, there's uh, no intention whatsoever, nor is there any record of withholding information. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Okay, colleagues, let us, let us deal with the issues. Honorable Mente, let's process the deviations before us um, with a, a due underscoring of the fact that all the deviations should have been here. Um, so let's deal with them uh, that are here. Honorable Mente, let's deal with the six. Um, Okay, Chair, but Chair, you must understand that once we start with the precedence, it's going to be very difficult for us to get ourselves out of it. I hear what the minister is saying that there is no deliberate uh, withholding of information, but at the very same time, we can't have an entity that knows very well it has to account on what the national treasure represented to us because our request uh, and the correspondence to them was that, respond to these deviations um, as outlined by National Treasury and the processes thereof that you are undertaking at this moment is as called. Okay, uh, let's first go to, let's go to the deviations which you have provided. I'm going to have a very much difficulty because I prepared for all deviations as indicated by National Treasury. Now, you have presented your first deviation as reference number 72. Can you take us through that? Who requested for it? Who signed for it? Why did they ask for that? And when National Treasury said no, what happened? Honorable Mentor, before they respond, I think it's important for the record in my correspondence on the 11th of June, on this hearing in preparation for this hearing of the 29th of June, indicated that the, well, I'm quoting now, the committee will be dealing with the expansions and deviations for quarter one, two and three of the 2020-2021 financial year. So just on the bullet debit to give you and the members the comfort uh, that from our side, uh, we had not uh, rocketed uh, or been selective in what we wanted. So I just wanted to, to place that, because this is correspondence I sent through on the 11th of June. Um, and I note what colleagues have said, and we will, we will, we will uh, 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 that. I will make a determination about it with your consultation at the end of the meeting. But progress uh, is cut. But from our side, that was the correspondence. Set. All right, Eskom, honorable, you are now in honorable mentor's hands, and I won't come in unless it's necessary as standard procedure that you know. Well, uh, Mr. Andrew Dereta will lead, I think, this uh, discussions with his team. Thank you. But Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Mente, for that question. Uh, could I request um, the Managing Director of our generation business, Mr. Philip Dukashi, to deal with um, National Treasury Reference Number 72 uh, to take us through um, the process on that particular one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ad address the questions that the Honorable Mente has asked rather than give a presentation. I think Honorable Mente asked specific questions and those must be addressed as part of this presentation. 
so that we answer her questions and what the committee needs. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Honorable um, Chairman and Honorable Members and uh, Minister. So, Chair, this was a request for approval to solicit goods from a limited market, and this was for air heater spares for generation power stations. So, this was going to be limited to Balkade um, and also Howden. Now, Balkade is the OEM or original equipment manufacturer for these air heater spares, and they had a license agreement with Howden. And Howden was the one that was manufacturing and supplying and delivering these air heater spares um, to, to our power stations. They had this agreement or this license agreement for some 20 years and it had been terminated. So that is why we then wanted to go to both of them, Howden, who had that license agreement because they, because they had access to drawings, they had access to all the uh, IP that was required and then the OEM themselves. Um, we, we sent the request to National Treasury. National Treasury uh, did not approve it. And their recommendations was to investigate Howden's conduct for supplying the spares and implementing design improvements, even though they did not have the required license. And that we must also ensure that only service providers who possess the required license uh, and or accredited by the OEM for spares are approached on fair and transparent money. And in this case, Howden actually did have that, uh, that license, but it had expired. So it, this request had not been approved. And so it was not uh, then actioned. What transpired after that, we were informed that uh, Howden has acquired Balkade in December, 2021. 2020, sorry, and that became effective in January 2021. So at, at the moment, we are um, still in the uh, process of uh, placing a contract for this pair. So we did not uh, uh, solicit the goods from a limited market because that had not been approved. We are finalizing a process and we are hoping that in uh, November, we will place a contract for these uh, air heater spares. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, um, I hear what you're saying. You've actually wrote all, the, all of that down. Who signed this request and at what, at what level? Was it at the executive level or the board level where this particular request was approved? That it must go through to National Treasury as a request and who signed for it? Uh. Chair, I'm, I must confess, I'm going to ask assistance in, in that. I've uh, been in the position for about five months. So I would assume my predecessor made the request, which normally goes to the CPO, and then the CPO is the one that submits it to National Treasury. That's the norm. I don't have the actual uh, specifics, uh, uh, Chair. Chair, Chair, please continue. Then our problems are starting already. Right. In the previous, a meeting where this particular meeting was postponed. We agreed that everyone who signed letters at ESCOM requesting uh, deviations, knowing fully well that those deviations were not in line. The reason why I'm looking for someone who signed, I want them to, to, to take us through as to why would they want National Treasury to engage in a fraudulent or unlawful or illegal transaction of approving wrong things, knowing very well that is not, why does it have to take National Treasury to tell them that is wrong? Now already we do not have, we do not have a person who signed the letter who then re, uh, was requesting this to National Treasury because we have National Treasury here. And I want to find out from National Treasury, National Treasury upon receiving this from this person, did you not send guidelines to these people as to what is required in terms of requesting for such deviations? Because it's this, this thing of signing deviations, it's coercing National Treasury to get into illegal things. Now already we don't have a person who signed that letter. We are not going to move. National, uh, Chair, I nearly said National Chair. Chairperson, please guide. <laughs> 
no, no, no. <laughs> that's fine. No, uh, the, you, I think the, 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 the issue to underscore then that response is we, we can't have a situation where it said I don't have specifics because we have always indicated that specifics is the name of the game when it comes to uh, the, these hearings. So can can we, what's my call? Can we get the cradle to grave journey of this deviation? Who initiated it and the processes that it went through? I, I think this point was ex 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 exhaustively explained the last time. Let, let, let's not have a revolving door kind of obfuscation here. Yeah, cradle to grave of this transaction, of this request. Uh, Chair? BH? Yes, I, I think the other request which we have made previously, when a person has been assigned to response, the assumption from our side is that that person has prepared and understood exactly what is needed from our side. Now, the continuous uh, uh, referral to the next person when the person who's supposed to respond was given an authority, it, it becomes a problem. We, 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 we've raised this matter previously. We said, when you appear before us again, please, stop referring uh, responses to the next person and the next person will ask the next person to respond. It appears as if you did not prepare thoroughly to, to respond or address SCOPA on issues pertaining to expansion and deviation. I'm, I'm humbly requesting that moving forward, when you are asked to respond, please respond fully. And if you are not prepared, give the next person, don't answer half questions and then the next person takes over. Thank you. No, that's fine. Let's be pointed. CEO, direct us to the person who initiated the request to solicit the goods from a limited market for the manufacture, supply, and delivery of air heater spares for generation power stations. That person uh, who initiated it. I think let's start there. Thank you, Honourable Chair. So the way the process works yeah, is that the delegation. The... Sorry, Chair. Proceed, CEO. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the way the process works is that the, um, in accordance with the delegation of authority, a request is put to group procurement, um, which is led by the chief procurement officer, and a request of this nature would have been signed by the chief procurement officer. Uh, in this instance, um, judging by the dates, it would have been Mr. Soliti Jangana. Uh, he is obviously no longer an employee of Eskom, so he is not present to uh, explain the process. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, Chairperson. Honorable Mentor. I didn't want to get to this point, really. The GCE says the process would be this. We want the exact process of this particular transaction, not the process would be this. But a general statement of how the process goes. If it's a general statement of how the process goes, it would have been correct all the way and there was going to be no need for National Treasury. Now, he even indicates that the person who signed here is no longer there. Then in terms of parliament, we have no issues of, of summoning people to come and account. The fact that the person is no longer at ESCOM does not mean that the people cannot come and account. We're talking about people's money. We're not talking about anyone's money. This, these are the taxes of people and ESCOM is in a dire situation. And another thing is that why are the letters not packaged with the information that we are providing here? Because you wrote the letters to National Treasury, National Treasury responded. Going forward, 
they, you have a file of that particular transaction. Not unless we are doing things there at ESCOM just for the sake of doing them, we don't even know where the letters are. A transaction of this nature where there is even question marks, you don't have a full information of it. Now we must wait and say, ordinarily the process goes like this. No, I don't want that. I want how did this particular transaction go? And the person who signed these letters must come and, uh, and, 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 and explain. How did you sign a letter and coerce National Treasury to be involved in an illegal transaction? And what informed that? Then it, gets, it takes us to the bottom of the problem and we actually get to the crux of the matter as to who did not do their job in order to make sure that this transaction doesn't get to a situation where there must be a deviation. A deviation is a process that is taken as a remedy of a situation that we can't get out of. But once National Treasury says, no, we can actually get out of this problem, it means that there was no problem, but someone created a problem. Therefore, the signatory to that letter must come and, ask and tell us, why did they create a problem? Because for National Treasury to say no, it means that you were creating a problem. That is not there. And we're coercing them into signing. That's what we want to know. Naturally, I'm not going to move forward where we can't get answers. No. It ends here. Can I just get a clarity? So was this um, request initiated by the former um, CPO? Yes, Jay. So, so the, the business will identify the need. So in this instance, it would have been generation. And the request to National Treasury will then be uh, signed by the Chief Procurement Officer. Uh, that, is, that is the process that is followed. So generation would have been the one who would have approached the CPO. Correct. Right, then let's go to generation. Because I think that the, that's the cradle to grave analogy I was making. That's where it started. Generation? Uh, Philip, can you uh, come in on this one, please? As the India of generation, uh, or director to one of your colleagues, please. Yes, uh, yes, Andrew. So, uh, as I as I indicated, uh, Chair, this the request was to go to a a confined market or limited market, um, because both of these companies could do their work. Um, Howden had the license, but it had expired. But they had the drawings, they had the know-how, and then Balkati was the OEM. So that that is the reason why both of them or at least the request was to approach both of them to create some form of competition between the two of them. Chair, if I may just uh, perhaps add, um, the, the way that the process works is that in um, a situation like the present one, um, which is a challenging to approach the, the open market. Um, we are required to approach National Treasury for their approval. So that is the, the lawful process uh, that the PFMA requires us to undertake. And the process, from what I understand of the PFMA, is exactly intended to allow National Treasury to give guidance to the entity to ensure that the PFMA is fully complied with. So the ultimate discretion uh, still lies with National Treasury uh, to approve a deviation such as this. So um, we are not in a position to coerce um, National Treasury. Uh, they have the absolute right to decline uh, approving uh, so there's no way that, that, that we can force them to um, give us uh, an approval. And I think we should also stress that um, an application for a deviation is not unlawful or illegal per se, uh, particularly when we follow the process as has been uh, indicated here. Uh, so we, 
uh, we do engage with National Treasury. Uh, we ask their guidance, and it is important that they um, are able to uh, exercise their oversight role as the guardian of um, expenditure, uh, particularly for procurement conducted uh, by state-owned entities uh, under the auspices of the PFMA. So um, the, the uh, deviations and expansions that were not approved uh, is, is not an indication of unlawful or illegal activity. It is an indication that there is a process provided for in the PFMA, uh, in terms of which National Treasury exercises its oversight role, and that role is, um, as is indicated, not only on this particular deviation, but also on the others, uh, then a clear indication that the process has functioned and that National Treasury has properly exercised its oversight role. Thank you, Chair. No, that that that, we, that is uh, elementary. Um, see, or we we fully we fully get that, uh, but the overriding principle we have uh, tried to ad nauseum express to departments and entities is that deviations and expansions are an exception and not a norm. And so, on that basis, and I just ask, why did National Treasury decline this particular deviation? Chair, as you can see from uh, the slide, that National Treasury uh, requested us to uh, look at the, um, can we just get the slide back up, please? Uh, National Treasury required us to investigate alternatives to the supply uh, from Howden um, in order to ensure that um, we, we don't have to revert to a um, single source supplier. Um, and they also then recommended that we must ensure that the service providers um, can be approached on a fair and transparent manner. So that, that was the, um, the recommendation made. Now, um, the recommendation was uh, overtaken by events uh, following corporate action, uh, during which time um, Howden acquired this particular uh, German company's interests. Um, Honorable Mente, your, Honorable Mente, your mic. CEO, proceed. All right, uh, Chair, apologies for that. Um, so we, we have, um, um, in accordance with, with the um, response, we, we didn't implement a deviation at, at the end of the day because of the change in the market following corporate action that resulted in this, in this merger activity. All right. <clears throat> so you see, you see oh, the, the, the question we, we always then ask in this case is why ordinarily would you have not done what national treasury says like can yeah can you just leave that screen up um, whoever's mon um just just leave it up because we're dealing with this particular tv show. so then what happens to what happens to the needs then of escom under those circumstances when you are um uh, Thanks, Job. Can you just leave it up, right? So, since now the acquisition, what what happens if you have not implemented the deviation? Now, did you proceed to deal with the need that ESCOM had for the air heater space? So, chair is indicated at the at the bottom following the merger. Um, rather the acquisition of uh, Balkadur Rotemüller by Auden, uh, the request for sourcing from a confined market was no longer required. So as I said, the uh, request to National Treasury was overtaken by events, and uh, we are in the process of providing feedback to National Treasury on this. 
So the need still exists. How are you acquiring the air heater space? Jennifer Ken, at the moment we do have a contract. The contract does expire at the end of October. That contract is with Howden. And as I indicated, we'll be placing a contract from the 1st of November, 2021. So we do have a contract uh, in place at the moment, both for spares and for maintenance of air heaters. And then moving forward. Mo moving forward, we are we have started a, a process, a commercial process, and we'll be awarding a contract from the 1st of uh, November. So that commercial process is currently in, uh, in, 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 in place um, or in, uh, in process. And we will be awarding. You've gone out on tender. So you've gone out on tender. You are so exploring the market. For the maintenance, yes, we are exploring the market. For the spares, because the spares are specific, we have uh, the OEM and we have the sole source that will then be starting on the 1st of November. And in this case, uh, because these two companies have now matched, we've got Howden. So Howden will be the company that. Uh, will be, has got the sole source uh, for the space. So they, you, you, there's a deviation there too that you wouldn't have to apply for. That, that, that is, yes, that is in place because they are the OEM. What do you mean that is in place? So, so for for the air heater, um, Howden is the OEM. So we 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 then before we proceed, we get the approval of National Treasury to start that process. So we'll not engage with uh, with them until. Sorry, Chair, I missed that. So National Treasury has approved that deviation. Yes. They, they would have approved it. Would have or have they? They, they have approved. They have approved it, Chair, and uh, that's why we are in that in that process now. We've started that process. We have not placed the contract yet. So the contract will be placed from the first of November. So then the under action taken, how do we arrive at saying ESCOM did not implement a deviation from competitive bidding process to a confined market? So the request was not for an, an OEM. The request was for a competitive uh, bidding from two suppliers, Howden and Balkade. So that was not approved because OEM as the, the second bullet indicates under National Treasury recommendation, they said we must ensure that only service providers who possess the required licenses or are credited by the OEM for spares are approached. Right. So in this case, there were two companies. Yeah. In this case, there were two companies about Kete and Howden, and we wanted to approach them. National Treasury said no. What has changed now is that there is only one company, and that company is Howden, and they are the OEM. Uh, something doesn't add up with this narrative. Um, yeah, but okay, che? no, it's fine. Honorable che. mentor. Che. Can we get National Treasury to come in here and explain to us why they did not support this particular uh, transaction and what should have been done in order to avoid even the request itself? Because for them to say they are not supporting, it means that there was a process that was supposed to have been undertaken prior by ESCOM and that process was not done. Remember, Chairperson, that we are dealing with the year of consequences. To be satisfied with what the generation is telling us does not mean we are dealing with a problem. And I'm actually not satisfied because it means they must 
again uh, apply to, to National Treasury. So please allow National Treasury to take us through and tell us why they did not support this particular one. National Treasury. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning to you and good morning to the honorable members and colleagues in the meeting chair. The reason why National Treasury didn't support this request was because, um, as, as stated, um, ESCOM wanted to confine this bid to two service provider, the OEM and, and, and another service provider who uh, is or was supposed to have licenses or accreditation by the OEM to provide the spares. Um, unfortunately, at the time when they were requesting um, for the deviation, um, the second service provider um, who is Harden did not have valid license or accreditation from the OEM to, um, to do any design work um, for the spares. Now, um, naturally what that then means is that only the OEM would be a sole provider of those services because legally they were the ones who owned the IP um, and could provide. So the natural process from then on would have been that ESCOM go on a sole source um, a, a, a procurement to the OEM to acquire the spares and any design work that then needs to be done. Um, um, and, and, and ESCOM is saying that what then since transpired when Treasury said no, you cannot approach um, service providers who do not have licenses and accreditation to provide this spares or the design work on the spares, um, go and approach the ones that can legally do this work. Um, the process would have then been to go to the OEM because at that point in time, only the OEM which was uh, buckled there um, to provide the spares. Um, however, at the time when we responded to this, I think it was around uh, June or July in 2020. Um, fast forward, ESCOM is saying that events then transpired. And um, if I understand them well, since December 2020, so six months after the process between ESCOM and, and National Treasury, um, uh, Howden then acquired the OEM and then immediately became the sole um, provider of the of of the, of, of the space. Um, again, then then the process from then on says um, if they are the sole uh, provider, the instruction note allows the accounting officer or the accounting authority to approve a sole source deviation um, uh, uh, um, to up, to up, um, to appoint the the OEM. Um, therefore, as a result. Uh, the process to approach National Treasury again sort of died um, as a result. Um, if I understand well um, and understood from the, 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 the briefing from um, ESCOM uh, uh, chairperson, they're saying that they then implemented a sole source procurement, um, which they're still in the process to write back to National Treasury and give Treasury feedback on the process that then they um, had followed to, to, to appoint the contract that I'm understanding should be put in place uh, in the next month or so. Chairperson, thank you. So it, it, so it means that for this particular transaction or project, there were only two people that could provide it and failure for the second one to acquire the necessary documentation, it leaves one person as a sole provider. Uh, there's no need to test the market for this particular uh, project. National Treasury. Um, that would be correct, um, uh, honorable member. However, uh, as I've mentioned um, earlier, at the time when uh, ESCOM approached, approached Treasury for this, um, Howden didn't have the licenses. So there should never, in my view, have been even a request for a confinement because Howden was not even an option because legally they couldn't provide the services to ESCOM. Uh, only the OEM at that point in time um, uh, should have been considered. Uh, Chair, thank you. So Generation, how did, how did it come about if then Howden was not supposed to be part of this according to National Treasury?
shared through through you. So how then had the license before and it, it had expired? Um, they had been supplying the spares for 20 years under license from Balkada. At the time, as National Treasury uh, points out that license had expired. So this was really just an attempt to try to create some form of competition for Balkada so that at least you had two suppliers. Um, but uh, National Treasury did not approve that and it was not implemented. Can I just ask a question? It, it was, was only one company uh, licensed? Yes, Chair, by Paul Kade, and that company was Howden. So, National Treasury, uh, can you then uh, speak to that? If only one, or you had a, you had a different position to the issue of licensing. Um, Chairperson, so the responsibility would have been to ESCOM to do proper market research and due diligence, and submit um, confirmation that the OEM has only one uh, service provider that they would have um, accredited in South Africa to provide um, the services. Um, and at that point in time, they provided that it was Howden um, that had the licenses. But that was the problem that we had, Chairperson, because not even Howden at that point in time had the license because, as ESCOM is saying, um, um, the license with Howden had expired. Um, so, so for us, it does, it, it, it does not matter if Howden has had the last licenses for 20 years. The, the matter of effect is that at that point in time, Harden didn't have the license and therefore they would not have been able to legally uh, provide the services to ESCOM. And that was our point. And that's why in our recommendation, we said, no, 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 you have to, con uh, if you are going to go on a confinement, you have to approach all the service provider that have service providers that have um, valid licenses or accreditation from the OEM in itself um, uh, to run this race and for you to to appoint the suitable service provider. Um, but from 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 ESCOM's um, information, Howden was the only one. But then the problem is that Howden didn't even have a valid license at that point in time, meaning that only the OEM. Um, as per the information that they had provided, could own, uh, service um, ESCOM uh, chairperson. Thank you. So, so what, all right, Honorable Hatebe, let's, uh, let, can I just finish and then I'll come to you. I see your hand, right. So uh, ESCOM, was the license still valid at the time of the application? the license had expired at the time of uh, the application. Right, so you're making an application for making use of services or making use of a company whose license had expired. Bakhtugash. Yes, come. Yes, chairman. So you are you are making an yes, application chairman. to make use of an ex with somebody whose license had expired. Yes, chair. So, the, and again, the thinking, rightly or wrongly, probably wrong in uh, in retrospect, was that this company had been doing this work. They had the drawings because they had the license, and they were they the thinking was that they would be able to supply this space and offer some form of competition to Palkata. But the license had expired. They, they are licensed uh, as a, which uh, essentially gave them OEM status had expired and Palkata was, was then the OEM who had supplied the space. Uh, was the market was the market tested to check that everyone else uh, uh, who has a license from the OEM is getting an opportunity to be 
a, a competition to Baokade. Honorable Hadebe, you'll come in after this. The chair, as, as I indicated, so this happened um, some time before me. So I will ask, uh, there is, uh, I've asked uh, Peter Leroux, um, who I think was part of Generation at the time, to try and give an answer as to whether there was a, a market research to establish if anybody else had been licensed. Well, Chair. Honorable Chair. No. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. No. Wait, 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 wait. Let's get no. that. Mm -mm. Wait, wait, wait. Let's get that from the record because he's now placed that question. Was the market research, right? And then we will come in. Was it done? Honorable Hatebe, you are not there. Was it done? No, I was just saying, can, can that question that ESCOM is posing to itself yes. be answered? And then you yeah. come in. No, I, let them answer one question, because my question was that, how did license had expired? Now, the original equipment manufacturer was the only one viable. Did ESCOM not conduct due diligence, which it's a serious cause for concern if you would do everything compile all the paperwork submit to national treasure without conducting due diligence have you have done that you would have picked up that the license had actually expired it only took national treasure to bring to your attention that what you are requesting for it's not practical to achieve because of the expired license. The issue here is failure for ESCOM to conduct due diligence and it needed an external uh, entity such as National Treasury to bring that to their attention. And it questions the number of uh, deviation that might have been requested without proper due diligence. Thank you, Chair. Um, on, on, let's get the responses to all the statements that have been made. Chair, my, I have requested Peter. Yeah, that's where we'll start. Yeah. No, that's where we'll start. I've requested Peter Leroux, who is a procurement manager within a generation and who was with generation at the time to see if he can source the information. Uh, Peter is in the meeting. I think he's, uh, he will be coming in just now. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Can, sorry, can you hear me? I'm trying just to connect. Thank you, um, uh, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, we on this question of uh, the um, Rottermiller Howden uh, transaction. Uh, de or yeah, Balkadir Rottermiller was the only uh, company with the IP. They are the OEM, and uh, as the OEM, they were the only ones that uh, had the original drawings for the for the spares at the end of the day. Balkadir Rottermiller provided Howden with a license to operate for a long period of time. So uh, at this point in time, and previously we had a contract with Howden that operated under the license of Balkadir uh, Rottermiller at the end of the day. Um, so when we asked the question on the confined market, um, both uh, Balkadir and Rot uh, both Balkadir, Rottermiller and Howden had the national had the drawings to to manufacture and supply the the spares at the, that given point in time. On the question whether we asked the question uh, to National Treasury for the confined market, uh, if Howden had the license at the time, there seems to be ambiguity on that. There was a legal dispute. 
um, that we came to know about it after we requested uh, that portion. So uh, it seems from hindsight, as uh, Philip has indicated, that at that point in time, Howden may not have had the license to operate um, uh, on the spares under license for Balkadir Rottemiller, but that only came to light uh, based on, on, uh, on legal uh, proceedings between Howden and uh, Balkadir Rottemiller after we uh, submitted the request to National Treasury. Subsequent to that, um, Rot uh, Howden then acquired uh, Rottemiller Balkadir as a company and now Howden is the only supplier that have got um, the IP Mr. for the And it's with that intent that uh, we never implemented the request for the confined market, as the confined market was then not no longer a confined market with one supplier, but it became a sole source with Howden acquiring uh, Rottemiller Balkadir uh, uh, to the latter part of 2020 and in the beginning of 2021. I hope that addresses the question, Chairman. Mr. Leroux, we, we've heard what you, you are explaining. The question posed to you by Mr. Tugashi is, did you test the market, if I'm summarizing it correctly? Because it's now been established that there was no license. License had expired, rather. Um, and then, um, colleagues, the Parliament TV has requested that if you are on the platform, Please turn on your camera. Um, I'm sure you will all see it there in the chat as well. So, yeah. so can we just can we just establish that particular issue? Was the market tested? Um, Chair, thank you very much. Chair, unfortunately, I'm on my mobile device, so I'm battling to switch on my camera. Okay. I will quickly that's try to do so right no, now. No, 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 that's understandable. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Okay. But, so um, Hey, proceed, proceed. We, we did um, at the time um, um, indicated or, or did not do a test the market. We did some market research and based on the market research, there was only the two companies um, at that point in time, which was Howden under license or under perceived license then, and then Balkadir as the OEM that could uh, do the spares. Um, when it comes to the maintenance, the maintenance portion of that particular environment has been um, sourced out through the open market. So it was open tender for the maintenance portion. But as the spares do relate directly to IP, our market research showed that only um, Balkadir and Howden had at that point in time the know-how of the spares. All right. So the market was not tested. And... Um... The license had expired. So it goes back to what Honorable Mento was saying. National Treasury was being placed in a very difficult position here. Because then it becomes National Treasury's decision on issues that you should have done. I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but I, does ESCOM get where, we, where we're going? That you, you see, because then you. You, you 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 stand free to say, well, I mean, it's ESCOM uh, National Treasury has said this. That's why I was saying earlier on something. Now it's come to light. Honorable Mentor, let's come back to you. And colleagues, I'll request that we all remain in the meeting. I know that there is a judgment somewhere, uh, but let's. Let's. I'm here. I'm here, Chairperson. Yeah. Right, Chair, Honorable Man. Chair, Chairperson. Okay, Honorable Hatta, Yeah. My my question still remains. Escom, were you not supposed to first confirm if Howden had a valid license before approaching National Treasure? And why didn't you do so? Chair? Honorable Mente? Uh, 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 
No, I wanted to check. Go, go, I think Honorable Adev had a, a problem. Honorable Adev, they say they checked, they knew that they, that Biden didn't have a valid license, yet they were coercing National Treasury to agree. That's what they are saying. Uh, amen. I rest my case. Let 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 me let me make this statement categorically very very clear, so that never again should it be lost on us when we take issue with these expansions and deviations. Expansions and deviations are a last resort in exceptional circumstances when every necessary due process has been exhausted, including, but not limited to, testing the market. It is not a way out. It is not a shortcut. It is not a leave at work at 4 p.m. kind of thing, because if I carry on, I'll have to leave at 9 p.m. No. It's an extreme case. And as the CEO has pointed out to himself and to his comment to us, that these provisions in the PFMA are there in the National Treasury regulations. But their presence in law and in the statutes of law are not the first resort. Because quite clearly, National Treasury was being placed in a very, very difficult and unfair position to have to make a determination on a matter which ordinarily ESCOM had not exhausted its options. And the body of facts was incomplete. It's totally unacceptable. So that there's no ambiguity on our side on that one. We have got a serious issue with these expansions and deviations because they induce other suspicions as and when they happen. So the only way to cover yourself is to do things completely right and go to national treasury when you've got no other option. Because precedence has shown us that the creation of chaos and emergency at times will then have to twist the hand of national treasury that if this doesn't happen, the country is going to go into a form of problem, trouble or crisis. Now, the issues of licenses are elementary research work. It, it's basic things. It's compliance matters on the people that you want to be dealing with. I hope I hope what the, the summary of this what of this thing makes sense to ESCOM. Because I mean the license has expired. I mean, because then the other question I want to I may ask is when did the license expire? Did it expire during your contract or it expired at the time when you were um, wanting a deviation? Because it will mean then you had been receiving work from unlicensed people because the license had expired. What does that do to the integrity of the contract that you had? Those are not things, these are not things that should be pointed out by us, ESCOM. I, I would really want to believe ESCOM is a high level uh, entity. It is the backbone of South Africa's economy and so the necessary skills, knowledge, expertise anchored in excellence should find themselves at the heart of ESCOM. And that none of these basic elementary things fall through the cracks. It just, it just, it, 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 it smacks of, <sighs> no, 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 guys. Uh, uh, honorable Ment. No, Chair. Mm. You know, Chair, 
earlier on, I said ESCOM should have packaged these things properly. But because we're taken for a ride, it's now proving why they only want to come and account for six deviations instead of everything is because, no, let's just go and account once and for all. Let's take this box and get done with it. If they look at the very letter they have sent themselves and the response of treasury thereof, it indicates that the license had been terminated. National Treasury made that clear. And Howden went to source this called the, 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 the license six months later. But the very same Howden has been there for 20 years. What does that tell you? Every specification is now being designed to fit and time given to Howden to get cor to correct itself and correct every documentation they have so that they must benefit once more. The another evergreen situation being created right in front of our eyes and then we get told, no, we're doing it correctly. That is why I said in the idea uh, a statement, if the people who signed these letters are not here because at the end of the day, this to and from, from generation one person responds, then another generation person responds and then the third one responds. If it's not the, the accounting officer that must take the fall for this thing, is the signature of the letter which was sent to National Treasury. Because for me, this is very serious. You cannot coerce National Treasury to agree on things that you, you know for very well that they are wrong. It cannot be. So the person who signed must explain under what circumstances or on which basis did they think that National Treasury is To a process which was supposed to have been undertaken. Who must take a fall for this? Because this is in all angles. It doesn't matter how you look at it. In all angles, this was being designed to benefit Audi. And it's wrong. It was a, there was a process which was supposed to have been undertaken way before the deviation is being considered as a, it considered as a last resort. Now, who must be dealt with for the transgression of not doing the right thing. We want to be de dealing with issues of national importance, but we are not going to have an ESCOM which wants to benefit certain individuals. Who has done a wrong thing here and who must take the full check? Yeah. Then they are frustrating, but <sighs> all right. And everyone, can we park this deviation? We'll 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 look at it. We'll make yeah, because it just it it speaks to weakness of internal checks and balances and controls, uh, which I'm sure the, the the CEO is noting. That I mean, there's elementary things and basic things. Uh, which really are just the function of ESCOM um, when they want to make these kinds of um, uh, applications. Um, you know, so yeah, um, let's park this one. Can you go to the next one? I just want to establish the trends. Chair. So you can go to the next one and park it. Yes, on a moment. Chair. When you say let's pack this, it means we'll have to pack all the deviations because my line of questioning is the same. The reason why we're here, we should have packaged. I did my preparation. Now I packaged everything. I've got their request. I've got National Treasury's response. I've got National Treasury's template, which was presented to us February this year. As early as February, National Treasury came to us and gave us all this information. They do have it too. But simply because they are not prepared to come to us, they are ticking a box. Let's go to score, but they go in to ask us questions, we'll just answer here and there, and that's it. Oxalayo will be done with deviations. It's not gonna be Oxalayo will be done. No, 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 there's no Oxalayo here. Kono uh, um, That's That's why I'm saying, Che, that's why I'm saying, Che, if we park, let's park everything. They must prepare themselves. Signatories must come. 
And if then a signatory, like in this case, is someone who's no longer in their own um, employ, no, there's no problem. Ourselves, we're going to summon people to come to scope. We have that right. No, 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 that, 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 there's no problem with that. That we can do, that we will do if necessary. But what I was trying to get at, I wanted us to probe another one um, to, so that we, we don't make a judgment call on the basis of one uh, probing of a deviation. Let's see what the next one reveals. This process should do processes, you see. As part of the question is why I'm, I'm, I'm saying to the CEO direct, but the CEO and his team are the ones who are running the trees here, which we should be sitting making a, an application for with someone who's got an, an expired license. I, no, you see. So let, let just table your next one and then we'll make a, a decision at the end of that one. Hello. I'm going to allow myself to be late. All right. Thank um, you. <laughs> let's go to the next one. The next one is reference number 75. Now I'm going to your sequence. I want to make things very easy for you. And I have got, I've got my own sequence, but I'll go with your sequence. You are now accounting on reference number 75. Leroy Building Construction was resident of Echo from June 2018, retaining the supplier Leroy will also ensure continuity whilst ensuring legislative compliance. That's your reason. And then in terms of your project description, you want a single source for services of an independent environmental control officer to monitor conditions of the integrated environmental authorization. National Treasury says no. It then National Treasury says you had ample time to ensure that a competitive bidding process is conducted when the contract expired in December 2019. Go and follow a competitive process. Who signed this request? At what level was it decided and communicated to whoever the signatory is? And why was it not done according to the prescripts of the PFMA. Yes, come. Honorable Chair, it's Peggy Kumalo here. I will uh, deal with this one, uh, Honorable Chair. This. Uh, Yes, Honorable Chair, this one was signed uh, last year in May, Chair, we at Camden, where we were building the, uh, the ash dam. So the request when was to, because this uh, environmental uh, monitoring is part of the legislative requirement, we, they were already on site. So what happened then, the key contractor that was uh, building the, the dam at Camden had to be terminated due to some irregularities and then uh, there were delays, but this contractor was already on site. Chair, Ch I just need to mention as well that the competitive bidding was already in process uh, from the uh, corporate side for the panel of contractors. So the team just felt that the, the, this one, because they were already on site, chair, it was more the issue of continuity of services, and they, they were also appointed through the competitive process. Hence, then there was that uh, requirements to, to request this uh, 
uh, deviation from national treasury. It was uh, the request came from the site team at Camden, uh, which was supported by the then general manager there on the project and signed by the acting group chief executive, and then also uh, submitted to, through the signature of the uh, later uh, CPO to the national treasury, but the request came from the, the project chair. So, so that was then the request. And then when it was not uh, supported, then luckily the, the panel contractor was already concluded from corporate. So the team then went into that. So it just meant that we needed to, to, to induct the new contractor and take them through. And during the time when this request was made last year, chair, we were also having a serious threat that came then with the closure of the power station. So there was also the attempt to, to expedite this process by keeping someone who was already on site who was acquired through the competitive bidding chain. So, so that's what transpired on this uh, transaction chair. Thank you. All right, honorable, okay. honorable mentor, may we, before you proceed, let's do this. Can we get National Treasury's comment on it? Because I think that helps us. Ne? National Treasury, your take on this one so that Honorable uh, can have the perspective of both responses. Um, yes, uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. Um, on this one, Chairperson, when um, ESCOM requested for this, um, they had a situation at um, the Camden Ash Dam Chairperson in 2019 that led to the um, a, a group executive for generation to declare an emergency in February 2019 in particular to mitigate the safety and environmental risks of the existing ash dam collapsing. Um, so, so, so that was the first thing that we had, the fact that the, the, the continuation with, of, of, of this service provider was on the basis of an appointment that was an emergency deviation in February 2019. Um, now, once that situation, and, and, and ESCOM was right in, in appointing um, without coming to Treasury because it was an emergency situation. But once an emergency situation has been um, dissolved, we, we did not find it justifiable that um, in May 2020, um, ESCOM would come to National Treasury to request for a deviation to continue with the service provider that was appointed on the basis of an emergency in February 2019. We believed that from that period and once the situation had been dissolved, um, ESCOM, if they required continuation of these services, should have gone out to the market to to appoint a suitable service provider for the long-term contract. And we said on this basis, we cannot agree and support um, ESCOM's request to deviate in this case. They must go and then test the market and appoint the suitable service provider through that process, Chairperson. Um, the, 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 the appointment through the procurement, uh, open tender procurement process um, of Leroy was um, the appointment in June 2018 um, that made us come to believe that Leroy had an understanding of the 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 um, uh, of the environment um, and and the issues with the uh, Camden News Ash Dam project, but um, that only made sense for them to be appointed for the emergency. Um, uh, in February 2019 because they were already there, but it just didn't um, make it justifiable for a, a, a service continuation um, in, in a, a year later, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Mentor, over to you. So it's a situation that's being created again. Uh, who signed? this particular request to National Treasure. Well, they must tell us what was the process that they had gone through to satisfy themselves that it is actually a legitimate as a situation and therefore National Treasure will agree to it. Who signed? Uh, 
Honorable Chairperson, uh, like I've indicated, the, the request came from the, uh, the site team, the project manager, which was uh, Mandla, and then, but the, the signature, it came from the acting uh, group executive at that time, uh, the Operosa, and then it was also signed by the CPO, who's then sent it to National Treasury Chair. I think the, the rationale, chair, like I said, the process of uh, the panel was already there. It was just to, to try and mitigate the, the risk at Camden because the, the station was already shut down because of this delay on the HDM after the previous contractor uh, contract was terminated. Chair. So, so that was that to, to say then to get a new supplier, it will just take a, a bit longer to, 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 to get them inducted and understanding all the, the requirement chair. But there was no, as I indicated, that there was already a process for these services that was uh, already on the go. And hence, when this one uh, was not uh, supported by uh, NT, we then uh, reverted to the process of the panel uh, chair that was there. It was just an issue to say, we have a station that has been shut down and then uh, the system was under pressure to see, let's try and get the people that already understand what needs to be done so that we can expedite the return of the units, Chairperson. Thank you. No, 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 no. The screen, can the deviation screen be put back up, please? As we proceed, on on the Kubera, on the man. Leroy was resident June 2018. A year and a half later, their contract was expiring December 2019. That's a year and a half. There's a person assigned to the project. There's a project manager who knows that by this time it's going to end. There's a person who leads administration in ESCOM who is supposed to oversee all diaries and follow up on every date. Who is that person who did not know that they should kickstart a process of bidding for a proper um, process of uh, procuring the services of this uh, in, 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 in environmental authorization? Who was there who did not know that they are supposed to do it? And it had to take National Treasury to tell them that no, in actual fact, it's no longer an emergency now. It's now a process, you are, you are appointing a person. You could have appointed the very same person if the person had gone through the proper bidding processes. But National Treasury says, no, go and do the proper process. You are not going to get us involved in you not following the rightful prescripts of the law. Who is that person who didn't do what they are supposed to do? Uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, if I may also uh, try to explain, I think Chair, like I indicated that the process uh, of these services was identified as a need for the broader business. Hence, there was a process initiated that cooperates for this panel of contractors. So, so in this context, Chair, it's not that the process was not uh, started to, to put a, competitive bidding uh, process. It was just uh, this one to try and uh, deal with someone who's already at the, on site during the time chair of, of the request. But the process and the need for the business was already submitted to the broader uh, project that was being put in place with all requirements from all the businesses uh, chair. So, so I think there was that and then the team then felt that they could uh, given the situation that the power station was facing at the time uh, to try and expedite the return of the units at Camden was to, to try and use someone who was already on site. But the process of acquiring the services pro through a competitive process was already in place. Chair. Hence, hence then when this one was declined, chair, then we, the team could revert into this uh, Process. Yeah, I did give the indication of the 
project manager on site, which was Mandla Zangalala, but then it was also signed uh, by the acting group executive at the time and the CPO chair as the signatories that need to sign everything that goes to national treasure. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Mentor, may uh, I just make a, just yeah, one quick intervention? Chair. Yeah. Yeah, Bob? No. You know, I don't, I don't, I, I really, uh, I don't get the name because now I, I have joined in with a very small budget. You know, I don't, I don't like this thing that's being done by ESCO. And I knew from the beginning they are going to do this. When did this uh, service provider leave the site? Their contract ended December 2019. When did they leave the site? Chair. Can we get a response to that, please? Yeah, on, Honorable Chair, uh, I think then uh, they, they left site after the, 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 the feedback from uh, NT because we were waiting for that request. And then after the request came back and then uh, the, the, the panel was used, uh, Chair. It was after the, the NT, after the NT uh, uh, did not support uh, this uh, no, that's not true. When did NT respond to you? It's not true, Chair. NT was with us in February. National Treasury uh, 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 was, what was the date in February when you presented these deviations to us? I can't go to my email because I have so many screens opened here. I'm going to be disrupted. National Treasury, when did you respond to us? Um, Chairperson, I think it was um, around the 20, between the 23rd and the 26th of February. Yeah. yeah. So when, when did you receive it? When, I ask home, when did you receive the response from National Treasure? I can just check the... the, the confirmation chair in terms of the exact data chair i don't have it with me here now i'll just confirm it now chair okay let's make it easy when did the, the service provider leave the site that you can you can't be looking for you should have it when did that particular service provider leave site because their contract was ending end of december they were no they were still not they were still there they didn't leave you were maneuvering your way of cohesing national treasury to agree on to wrong things. So when did they leave? They left on the 31st of December, Chair. Last year, Chair. You are contradicting yourself. You said you waited for national treasury's response. Now they left 31 December. When did you receive national treasury's response? Chair, I'm just uh, getting the team to uh, just to get that uh, specific date of the response from National Treasury, uh, because I think if from the records that I had, Chair, it was in June last year as well, Chair, when National responded to us that uh, with that feedback. Honorable Mentor, as you try, and can I just, uh, I'm gonna ask a very grade one question. Uh, like one of, oh, uh, yeah. Next, uh, ESCOM, are you, you are in agreement with the NT recommendation as you have summarized it there, that ESCOM had ample time to ensure that a competitive bidding process is conducted when the contract expired in December 2019, and that follow a competitive process. Like categorically, do you accept that? Yes, sir, that is accepted, sir. But you see, this is precisely what I've been trying to point out. This is, 
you know I, I i i i just wonder honestly honestly wonder why you put yourselves in this position and then put us in this position when we have to grapple with i won't say with with elementary failures to comply It doesn't look professionally. Eh? And so I think, Honorable Man, that's what I was saying. Let's unpack it because, I mean, all the things we have had there, ESCOM must accept responsibility that it did not make use of the time. And then the question becomes when National Treasury makes such a determination, where's the consequence management for people who should have done the work in the time? in time rather and then didn't do it or does it it's just another day with the, oh well the, I, I think can can the board note note that and i would like their comment and reaction to that when clearly then if you had the time and didn't do the work in time the question becomes what were you doing in the time in which you should have been doing this work how does one remain in work when they are, for all intents and purposes, collapsing contract management? Because clearly what th this finding from uh, and determination by National Treasury speaks to a dereliction of duty, which then must be punished. It can't just be noted, you know, ESCOM is not some Spazanyana entity. So I'm, re I'm really wanting to know what happens to individuals who are just plainly and frankly not doing their work. Because if you can't meet internal deadlines or plan accordingly internally for contracts, bidding processes and so on and so forth, then what are you doing? Uh, Honourable Chair, maybe if I may cover that point, Chair, just to... Uh, and, then the brief, and, then the, and then just wait, sweet. And then the brief summary there says, incorrect procurement mechanism followed instead of using environmental panel, new supply. I mean, and this is your own summary. I bug it. No, no, no. No. Something has got to give. Board, executives, something has got to give. Which, as I want to, we should be sitting here settled with complex issues in so far as why a deviation was not supported. Not this first year thing that we are seeing here. It's unacceptable, and I hope there'll be no means to try and justify it, because if you accept what National Treasury has said, and as we have put it there, the only response I should be expecting is accepting responsibility and accountability for it. Because if there's anything to try and justify it, it we're not going to accept it. These things are just totally, totally unacceptable. Right, Honorable Mente, I ESCOM wanted to say something, but I hope they note the last part of what no. I just said. Chair, you know, you know, Chair, it would have been nice to have the signature of the request to National Treasure to outline their own request and that, and then tell us that the, the one of National Treasure, because from where I'm seated, I'm seated with correspondence, and I am doing a comparison of statements between what the uh, official of ESCOM is telling us and what I'm reading here. So 20, 2019, contract was ending. And then he says 2020, 31st December, the, 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 the service provider left. Then, but then uh, National Treasury reverted back to them way before that. But still, 2020, almost the whole year of 2020, the sub, that service provider was on site without a contract, without agreement, and without a new contract 
the new suppliers contract was effective from January 2021. The whole of 2020, we had a person who was on site illegal. Look at it, Chair. Their summary says, we on January 2021, we had a new contract. Good enough. But what happened during 2020? Because that contract of that supplier ended December 2019. And then we must sit and say, no, it's fine. We are here and what your explanation is. When there's a person who knows very well what they were employed for, unless you are employing officials who do not know what they are there for. But at the very same time, I can give them a benefit of a doubt. However, chief procurement officer will not be engaging in such things. That is why it's important for the chief procurement officer to answer why did they do it? Thanks, Chair. Just come. Yeah, yeah, Honorable Chairperson, uh, well, I take note of the, the comments uh, you made and also the Honorable Mente. I just wanted also to indicate to you, Honorable Chair, that there were consequence management done to the uh, general manager who was uh, uh, responsible for, for that area as well because of the delay in uh, executing this contract and also the project manager there at, at Camden Chair. But yeah, well, I take... Uh, Full responsibility. Can management. Can you unpack it? What does what does it entail? It it, it was a, a, a discipline against the, the 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 project manager, the general manager there at uh, Camden Chaperson, and then who have since then uh, uh, left the the employer of Escom. Chair. That. What sanction did you give them? Did they resign or were they dismissed? It, I think Chair, they, 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 they resigned uh, afterwards, uh, Chair, after the, 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 the there was not an automatic dismissal from, from that Chairperson. Uh, so what sanction was given? What was the sanction? Uh, I will just check the, the, the exact uh, uh, sanction because uh, that was uh, muted there, Chair. I will then respond with it, uh, Chair. Okay, that's fine. Please just uh, put pen, just note that for me and remind me on that. All right, Honorable Mente, we are in your hands. Now, the other members can engage on this particular one before we continue. But colleagues, are there any issues you'd like to raise on this particular one? Colleagues? Yes, Chair. Honorable Hatebe, proceed, ma'am. No, I think, Chair, we, we covered. I, I did not quite get the response on the issue of time as alluded to by the National Treasury, that at first it was uh, February 2019 when this emergency uh, started. Um, I didn't get the sense why did it took so long for ESCOM to start uh, the process of competitive bid. Uh, this speaks to the issue of creating a, a self-made crisis and then finally resorting to deviations. Um, I, I did not get the response in that aspect, Chair. Uh, the person, the, the project manager for this uh, uh, pro uh, project um, was, he also um, called to account in terms of consequence management or is he left scot-free? Can I get the response, Honorable Chairperson? I was still in the same meeting, uh, colleagues. Yeah, yeah, Sukonaba. Yeah, we are here. Oh, I, I thought you are preoccupied with the judgment. Can can I get the response? 
Honorable Chairperson, uh, through yourself, I think, like I've indicated, uh, uh, Chair, that the, the general manager who was uh, responsible for this uh, uh, portfolio, there was a, a, a action that was uh, initiated uh, against him uh, by then the, the then acting uh, group executive for group capital, Chair which was also partly also dealing with uh, this matter and the other matters, Chair. I'm just uh, waiting for the, 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 the sanction that uh, was muted on that, but it was not that he was left uh, uh, scot-free, uh, Honorable Chair. Mm -hmm. no, th thanks, Chair. We can proceed. All right, uh, honorable mentor, wanna try one last one? No, they've provided six. Proceed, okay. next one. Okay, um, I'm going to skip this one. I'm gonna come, come, come back to it. The one of WBHO. I wanna go to 68. Makoya Supply Chain Holdings. You say after National Treasury says single source not supported, you are saying um, you sent out a closed RFP, however, issued to both suppliers as per National Treasury response. Sable did not respond and the contract was concluded with Makoya supply chain. So why, why did it have to take National Treasury to tell you what you were supposed to have done? Good, good morning. Uh, good morning, honorable members and, and uh, everyone on this platform. Um, uh, Chairperson, it is my understanding that we, we um, it, at Highfield Industrial Park, there are two suppliers with the offloading facilities, but Sable did not have all of the technical equipment to do the job. So that's why when we made the application, we made a single source application. But National Treasury then, in their response, said, please issue a closed tender. So we complied and did that. And in that closed bid, when we offered it, it was only Makoya that in any event tendered again. So, so um, hence, hence the reason why we made a single source application to National Treasury. And the application was signed by uh, Segi Chetty and Precious Edward Pesha from a business unit perspective. It was then approved by, supported by Dan Mashiko, who was the, was the general manager at the time. And Becky Kumalo and Soli Chitingano signed the application from an ESCOM perspective and submitted it to National Treasury. Thanks, Chair. At which level was it approved? And then was it a committee? Was it an at executive level or was it was it a board? Which level approved it? Um, Jay, could it have been approved by a tender committee at that level of that, that can approve a 2.1 million a approval subject to empty approval? I can I can get that exact uh, I can at, at that point in time I can get the exact details as to exactly which committee it was approved at and on what date it was approved at that committee. We have the detail, I just don't have it on hand, Chair. Yeah, that's exactly why I'm asking you at what level because you are giving us half information. You should give us the entire process. A bit adjudication committee had to sit, and the committee's recommendations were one, two, three, four, five. And who was the chair and who are the people there in that committee? Now yeah. we don't have that information. We, we can certainly provide that information, Chair, if this was approved at a bid adjudication committee or because of the value being small or relatively small, 2.18, and then it could have been approved within the delegation of authority. But I can get that information. I just don't have it on the exactly. uh, Please give us a full process. It was for National Treasury to say, go and do the right thing. It means that there are steps that then you went and reverted back to. 
And what were those steps? Not a half cooked information. No, no, Chair. Let me let me go one back. What I'm saying is that in making an application to National Treasury, there's a delegation of authority that's followed within ESCOM. That was followed. The exact details as to that I can give to you. Once that's approved, a submission or application is made then to National Treasury. When National Treasury recommended that a closed but be, be issued, that's when it was issued. So that, that entire process, we can give it to you. I, I can certainly uh, make that available to you. Thanks. So after after following all all of this uh, process, what what was the status before you applied for the deviation, and what is the status now in terms of the services that uh, ought to be provided to ESCO? No, so so the 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 service. I mean, the the contract was placed with Mokoya. They have delivered the service, and the trains were subsequently offloaded. This is the 26,000 tons of coal that was uh, stranded on the rail network. The offloading, there's only three offloading facilities in, in SA that have these rotary tipler offloading facilities. So, so that service was provided, the trains were offloaded and service completed. So there's no need to offload any coal anymore in the future? No, uh, so for this particular, so if I can just give you some background again, in, in the Majuba conveyor system was damaged from a, with a fire. Now in December, 2019, when that was fired, there was coal en route to Majuba power station via train or rail. Because that was en route to rail, we, we, we stopped all rail deliveries to Majuba Power Station at that date. But the, the coal that was in transit to Majuba Power Station, we had a problem with because we needed to offload it. And the only places you could offload it is either at Majuba Power Station, which was in not in operation, or the Richards Bay Coal Terminal, which is which is in Natal, or we, we, we looked for another facility, which was Makoya. Hence, it was only these six trains at a once-off facility when the Majuba operations resume, we will start the rail deliveries again. So this was a once-off uh, rare, um, uh, call it a requirement that we had to we had to go through. Okay, and now I, I suppose you have now gotten um, the information in terms of the level of the body which dealt with this process. How much time did they give uh, the RFP out? And was Sable given a fair competition? And indeed, can you confirm that Sable did not bid? I, I, can, I can confirm that Sable did not bid. I can, I can, um... But, but as to the exact uh, details of how long or, or the period of the tender and stuff, again, I can get that detail and give that to you guys. I, I don't have it on hand, apologies. But certainly they were given time and they did not respond. That confirmation I can give you. Well, Chair, I'm going to request that you, you, pack, you pack this one until we get all information on this, there is a very interesting information on this particular transaction. Okay, that's fine. You park we are it. going we can to park to it and one. wait. Yeah, and wait for the full information as to which which level uh, approved it and uh, communicated to Chief Procurement Officer or whoever was a signatory of the letter to request. Um, I'm going to request that National Treasury come in on this one. If they are satisfied, it's fine. You can, no, you can pack it. You can proceed to the next one. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, the next one is South 32.
who signed off on the request of South 32? Where was it decided that there, there must be a request to National Treasury? But then it also National Treasury did not agree. And sure. send you back. Uh, can we get information on that? With, with pleasure. Thank you, Honorable Mente. Um, so basically, um, the, this particular application at that time was signed by Dan Mishiko, who was the general manager for primary energy, and uh, Solly uh, being the CPO uh, that signed the, the request for deviation to, to NT. Just to give you some background. So in, in June 2019, South 32 declared hardship on this long-term fixed price Duva coal supply agreement that ESCOM uh, entered into in the, in the 90s. So, so ESCOM appointed consultants to verify the hardship claim. And this is a contractual hardship claim in terms of the agreement. And our consultants guided that there was no hardship as defined in the contract, but there certainly was financial distress. Now, Saturday, it's important to note that Saturday, Saturday too disagreed with our interpretation of the hardship clause. But again, our consultants guided that there was financial distress at the mine and ESCOM should seek to negotiate with South 32 in order to alleviate any coal supply risks. So Chairperson, in the thinking at that time of this application was to renegotiate the entire agreement, which was effectively an agreement that ended in 2034 after 14 years at that stage. So hence, you, hence the 67, a billion rand application deviation, which is which is the subject of this discussion and the application and uh, that that National Treasury did not support. So the 67 billion rand application was basically it's a 10 million ton coal supply agreement for 14 years into the future that we were looking to renegotiate. And 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 like we said, NT did not support that. So post the above application for deviation, a number of events have since transpired, which you will see in future deviation applications before this committee as well. And the story, however, is further, further slide in front of you and will sort of be consistent in future when you see some of the, the future deviation applications as well. And the events transpired as follows. So after reviewing the technical information and discussions with South Eritu and Saviti, what the assessments indicated was that the mine should only continue at a tempo of seven and a half million tons per annum. Previously, we, we had a contract for 10 million tons. It was, let's drop it to seven and a half. And that the contract ended in 2024. And the reason why it ended in, the reason why it was thought to end in 2024 is because the technical information showed that beyond 2024, the capital requirements to recapitalize the colliery was substantial. And the operating cost to mine the remaining reserves were also quite high, which made which started making the coal econ economically, uh, I mean, not economically mineable beyond that point. So ESCOM then accordingly made another deviation application, which, which NT had rejected. And after some engagements with NT, they finally approved uh, this particular transaction on the 1st of May, 2021. So you will see this process unfold when we when we bring the subsequent deviation applications to you or before this committee. Um, important, important point is that ESCOM has gone out to test uh, the market via an RFP to determine the long-term coal supply solutions for Juba power station. And this process is currently unfolding, um, you know, in terms of that, uh, in terms of that prescribed process. So Chairperson, that's in summary what what and why we applied for this particular deviation application and the reasons back at that stage when we made the 67 billion in application. Thank you, Chair. Now, um, National Treasury said, ESCOM should test the market. And your, your point of contention becomes South 32's problems that they had. 
I'm not hearing what did you do to test the market or what is stopping you from testing the market, but dwell much on ensuring that South 32's problems are solved. Did you test the market other than occupying yourselves up with South 32's problems as a service provider to ESCO? Sure. So, so let me let me state that we we have gone and tested the market, and the process to completely test the market is as we speak unfolding. That's the first point. I think I think the more important point, which is the engagement we were having with with uh, National Treasury, is that contractually between ESCOM and South 32, there is a 14 or there was a 14 year coal supply agreement. And in terms of that 14 year coal supply agreement, there are certain rights and obligations that are afforded to both parties. Now, in terms of those rights and obligations, South 32 contractually has a right to declare hardship in terms of that coal supply agreement, which they did. So we had to contractually test and, uh, and afford them an opportunity to test that hardship agreement before just testing the market. But we were, so what we were doing is in parallel to affording them that opportunity in terms of dealing with that hardship claim, we tested the market. So the testing of the market is done and is busy unfolding as I've spoken to you. The important, in, in addition to South 32 declaring hardship, they have also declared they are, uh, are selling this operation and that if they do not find a financially viable solution to this, to this operation, they were going to put this operation into business rescue. So it's important to understand that in, 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 in um, uh, this operation was running at a loss and that they were weathering the loss in terms of uh, a continuous monthly loss until a solution was gonna be found. But the solution or the loss or the weathering of that loss couldn't be open-ended. They had to cap it at some point in time. And they gave ESCOM an opportunity to engage with them to find a solution for Duva, which is what we did. So we engaged National Treasury and explained the rationale for how we were progressing with this matter. I think in consultation with National Treasury, there were, there were a couple of issues, uh, and National Treasury is online as well, that, that, that I think were key in the discussions with National Treasury. The first thing is, did we go out to test the market? And, and we have. The second thing that, that was important to National Treasury was also they wanted to do an assessment to verify what, uh, what we were saying. And I think the timing of that assessment was, um, the timing of that assessment was, um, what was important because, uh, you know, it would take a couple of months to do a full-blown technical assessment. So what we did is we supplied National Treasury with all of the information that we had done for them to assess the technical and the financial and the, and the assessment that ESCOM's consultants made with regards to the scholarly. For, further and more importantly to that is that after National Treasury provided us with the consent uh, or the approval, we then contractually also built into this current consent agreement whereby National Treasury can still post the consent, do an assessment should they require, and should if the if the if the uh, assessment yields a result which is vastly or very different to what ESCOM has has put on the table, there is an exit clause out of this current arrangement as well. So we try to build in the National Treasury views into this picture as well, Chairperson. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Can we have National Treasury on this matter, please? Okay, National Treasury. Um, Chairperson, thank you very much. Um, I think on this one, Chair, um, you know, it, it, it is quite important that we look at it from um, a holistic picture because there's a number of um, applications, um, and if you look at the briefing by ESCOM that is on the screen, there's an issue of a deviation um, that National Treasury didn't approve in quarter two for the 67 billion. Um, 
But when you look at the reasoning for the deviation and ESCOM's action, there are, we are talking about extensions. So there were two processes that were going um, at, at parallel, um, if I remember, if my memory serves me well, Chairperson, um, that looked at this issue of South 32. There were, um, there were requests for deviation, um, which the Treasury did not support, but at the same time, there was requests to modify the existing uh, contract with South 32 um, to assist to deal with the issue of the hardship that um, South 32 had declared and ESCOM was um, engaging with the process, the legal process of dealing with the issue of the financial hardship. And as part of that process, the, 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 the mo contract modification that was submitted was to extend a contract, that particular contract with South 32 for a period of time um, with a financial implication with which National Treasury then said to ESCOM, ESCOM, we are going to support and, um, and agree to you extending this contract for the period of time as provided by um, um, uh, um, ESCOM, um, but in this period, uh, you must test the market um, to make sure that the process of um, securing coal supply for ESCOM remains um, fair, trans uh, transparent, competitive, um, and all those five key pillars um, of public procurement. What was critical for us, um, Chairperson, in considering um, the deviation as provided in the briefing is the fact that um, the contract was set to, ex um, to end um, in December 2024. And this request for deviation wanted to um, implement the 10 year extension um, that uh, 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 amounted or had the financial implication for 67 billion. And we said, but without testing the market, um, you should not do that. Um, it is important that you, you implement um, a tender process, um, but we understood that it is important for you to secure uh, supply in the period that you are, are, are dealing with uh, um, uh, the tender process. And therefore, in securing that supply, it was important that that contract with um, South 32 be modified. Um, and we also, within that period, granted um, a, a ESCOM a, a, a price adjustment to allow um, a, 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 a ESCOM to assist South to do in dealing with the financial hardship. Um, but as previously provided chairperson, we've had numerous um, engagements with ESCOM on this matter. And some of the uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, concerns that we raised and we said that ESCOM National Treasury um, processes, we need to conduct an, our own independent assessment to factually get um, information around this financial hardship. Well, firstly, because um, National uh, ESCOM and uh, South 32 were not agreeing on the extent of the financial hardship, but also for National Treasury to verify the reasons why um, uh, uh, ESCOM preferred a South 32 to continue with the supply for this extended period. So it, it, it is still a process, Chairperson, that National Treasury still has to undertake take um, because we need the suitable uh, skills and competences to conduct such a technical assessment for National Treasury to be able to um, provide its, its, its position um, on, 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 on this deviation in particular chairperson. But I think like um, my colleague from ESCOM has provided that it is important that this matter be looked at holistically considering all the other events that then um, occurred and, um, and, 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 and the changes in, in, in the, in the, in the um, in this, uh, sequence of events since the application for this de deviation chairperson. And also considering 
the um, modifications as well um, of this contract that ran parallel to Honorable Mente. I think Basani was still on someone. Okay. Sis Basani. Someone disrupted her. Um, Ms. No, no. Yes, Chairperson, I am I was done, Chair. Thank you. Okay. All right. Honorable Mente. Uh, thank you very much, uh, National Treasury. Um, after South 32 then declaring the, the hardship and you agreeing to the increase in terms of the pricing, was there an assurance or confirmation from them that in the next four years that you have extended to, they will be able to carry the business forward and did they declare their recapitalization process thereof? Because there was a very uncomfortable and disturbing news we have found that ESCOM want to bail out South 32, but they are on bailouts themselves. What is the recapitalization process of uh, the South 32? And are we sure that they are fit for purpose? Chairperson, if I can uh, answer that. So the recapitalization of this particular mine, South 32, I, in, it is our understanding that South 32 have not made the decision as yet. So after 2024, the, the mine um, is expected to come to a closure and the closure process has started. But to give comfort to the committee, what we have certainly put in place uh, just in case they decide to start the mine and then supply coal to other people, we have got a, uh, call it a, an option, a first right of refusal option, which allows it, ESCOM to buy coal at a certain uh, pre-agreed price should they continue mining the coal, which is effectively their cost plus a 10% margin. So if they continue the mine, our assessment says that it's very expensive for them to continue the mine and that they will probably close. But if for whatever miraculous reason they decide that they can continue the mine because of some other information or something else that has come to party, then we've got a step in right to walk into that agreement and claim or get buy coal from them at a certain parameter. And, we, and we've got that option. It's an annual option all the way to 2034 that we can exercise. If I can give the committee that comfort that we've managed to build that into the agreement as well. So we are not aware that they recapitalize in the mine. And, and again, it is our understanding that they can potentially supply the coal with the remaining reserves up until 2024 at the tempo that has been agreed to in the current agreement. I, I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Are you engaging in bailing uh, South 32 out as ESCOM? No, we are not engaging in bailing South 32 out, but understand that part of the sale agreement between South 32 and Seriti, there was a condition precedent that required a solution to be found for this particular mine. So this is the solution that we found, but we are engaging in no bailout, or I am not aware of any bailout of South 32 or anybody else, except we finding a solution for this particular coal supply agreement. Chairperson, I hope I'm again answering your question. So your solution then became uh, to increase the rate of coal per unit or per whatever way you are measuring it. Was that your solution, which National Treasury also alluded to that they have agreed to you increasing the rate? Uh, Honorable Mente, one of the things that um, when we described uh, this particular issue on this platform before, what we said was that 
uh, Duva power station was built and it was designed to receive coal from the adjacent mine. So the, there is a reclaim capability constraint at Duva power station to reclaim its full burn requirement. So in the short term, even if you could bring coal into Duva power station, you would most probably have a coal or an electricity supply risk because they cannot reclaim the, the amount of coal. So we had to seriously look at the coal supply from the adjacent mine. We then looked at, the, at a competitive or an affordable price to ESCOM in terms of what we prepared to pay for coal, for this particular coal. And that's where we kind of ended up with in terms of a solution. I'm just giving a very, very brief summary of how we ended up there. So in the short term, we feel that for the next four years, this is the best option for ESCOM while we as ESCOM go and test the market for a long-term solution and then understand which is the best way to supply that, uh, that coal to Duva power station, meaning it, if it needs to go in via the, the infrastructure of the mine or the power station. But in arriving at the solution, we did secure certain benefits for us, we think technical benefits. As an example, if it is that it is easier to use the mines infrastructure to bring in coal to do a power station, then this agreement that we struck with them uh, compels them to allow us to use the infrastructure. The infrastructure and the mine will have to be upgraded at our cost to bring it exactly to where we need it, but at least it allows us to bring in coal without creating sort of supply disruptions at Duva. So, so hence we have technically looked at that and commercially looked at that and we found or we think this is the best solution for Duva Power Station. Thanks, Jay. How long does it take to conclude um, a research on coal mines that could provide uh, ESCOM and are there alternatives to this um, South 32, which are situated closer to Juba power station or any power station that of that will require the coal? How long does it take? So, so that's the process we are unfolding. We started, we, we went out to tender or the, 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 the RFP closed in December, uh, December last year. We, we, we then went through an evaluation process of that RFP and we expect to take the approvals to engage in terms of that RFP through to our ESCOM governance structures. We anticipate that process to um, unfold, I think it's July or August 2020 this year. And then we can start engaging the, the uh, call it preferred bidders in terms of the outcome of that RFP. The process to then get a supply from each of the preferred bidders is depending, it depends on what stage each bidder is. So you could get, call it your preferred bidder one, who's, who's got a greenfield operation and would take him uh, 24 months, I mean, sorry, about 36 to 48 months to start up his mine, depending on the size of the mine he's starting up, versus somebody who's already got a mine that's open and they can start supplying you immediately. That answer we can technically only give you once I start engaging that market, which is what are the alternative supplies to the to Duva power station. Again, I, I just want to stress, it is absolutely important to understand that the supply to Duva power station need, currently is designed to come from the mine. So if we want to bring alternative supplies into Duva power station, there is going to be some call it infrastructure infrastructure upgrade that is going to be required at Duva power station. And we need to do that as well. So we need, we need to understand both legs before we can answer, a, a, answer an uninterrupted coal supply solution to Duva power station. So this solution in front of us gives us four years to firstly completely evaluate our supply options, but also the infrastructure requirements so that beyond 2024, you can then get a seamless supply to do a power station. That's the thinking thought behind what we what we put forward in front of you. Thanks. So you are confirming that beyond 2024, everything else that's required in order 
to get coal to do a power station will be completed and there will not be any extensions beyond that? No, what I'm, what I'm saying to you is beyond 2024, we are evaluating an RFP process. The outcome of that RFP process will be what we will implement beyond that. If the preferred bidder in terms of that RFP process is South 32 again or the Serenity, then, then that is it. But I, I don't know the outcome of that until it gets approved. And, and sorry, evaluated and negotiated. Now, my, my, my question then it was that beyond 2024, if it happens that it doesn't become South 32, do we have, will we have the um, infrastructure and all the necessary processes finalized by that time that we will not have to come back and ask for another deviation? Honorable Mente, we've got four years to put that in place. So sitting here, that is the intention to do that, but we have not done it yet and we must do that. So we've got four years to put what you are asking for in place. So the intent, is certainly that, that after four years, there should not be a supply interruption at Duma Power Station. But, but I can't sit here and confirm that we've done it because we have not done it yet. We have not evaluated that as yet in terms of what is the best solution beyond 2024. Yeah, you know the problem, uh, Chair, with this issue of South 32 and this four years, which um, also is inclusive of the infrastructure. You remember the issues of the conveyor belts. That's the infrastructure that what, uh, the uh, official of ESCOM is talking about because South 32 is the one that is utilizing those conveyor belts into the power station. And those conveyor belts are owned by ESCOM. That's what we were told when we get when we were at ESCOM. But now we have to source coal from other mines in terms of competitive uh, market and go test the market of the other mines, which will not be utilizing conveyor belts which I assume that's now the infrastructure the official is talking about. And that infrastructure, obviously, because if then the mine is not as adjacent to the power station like this South 32 is, it's far. It means that they will have to pay trucks and that's what they have to assess in terms of this whole process. And that's my question, sir. Will this process of ensuring that all those things are taken into consideration, are measured accordingly, are priced accordingly, and the costing is then um, reasonable for ESCOM, and that all of that process will be finalized after 2024, because that's the final extension you got now. Uh, Honorable Mente, that is absolutely the intention. It's to look at what is the cost of our supplies, what is the transport cost into, into Duva power station. Should we do that via the mine or should we do it via the power station? Whose infrastructure do we need to upgrade? Can we utilize existing infrastructure that we have contractually via this process managed to get a complete commitment that we can utilize existing infrastructure on the mine side to, to bring in coal? So we will do those technical assessments, the financial assessments behind it, and we've got four years to put that in place so that beyond 2024, we have a seamless cost-effective or the best cost-effective solution for dual supply post-2024. I think we, we're talking exactly the same thing. It's just now we've got four years to go and do it. That's great. My last question to you is the hardship that was declared by um, the I South 32. Know. Yeah. So the hardship that was declared by South 32 already out, out, out of your response and my understanding is that it does not uh, include the infrastructure because the conveyor belt is yours. Now... No, 
that they yeah. are they are hardship which they have declared of which you found the solution to increase the rates in order to meet them halfway with the processes i mean with the capital uh, or liquidity um, liquidity thereof or for their or for, for their mind was it your problem to solve or was it their problem to solve um so so honorable mentor if i can just explain the coal mine and the coal station is right adjacent to to each other so there are conveyor belts coming from the mine that that if i can use a farm fence as the boundary line there's a conveyor belt that runs on the mine on the mine side supplying coal to escom which then which then passes a call it a boundary fence of some sort and then goes onto the power station side and into the power station. So the conveyor belt on the power station side is the power station's conveyor and the conveyor belt on the mine side is the, is the mine's conveyor. Between the two entities, we know exactly which point, who owns which part of the conveyor. That's the first part. The second part is that when, when, um, when, when South 32 declared hardship, they declared hardship on the price they were receiving for the coal supply to ESCOM. So, so in terms of the contract that it was priced at a certain price, it was around uh, 280 rands a ton, if memory serves me correct. And they, and they were, um, I mean, that's the price we were paying them for coal and the cost of mining the coal was well in excess of four, five, 600 rands a ton. So, so the hardship wasn't around the, around the conveyor. It was around the complete cost of mining the coal versus the cost that they were, or the price they were selling into ESCOM. So we had to solve for that. If we didn't solve for that, they would continually continue to, to be in a financially, uh, call it loss-making situation, and that needed to be resolved. And if they were only prepared to fund that loss-making situation to a point before they would have declared this thing into business rescue, why is it important for ESCOM to have stepped in? There's a security or supply risk issue. If we could meet do us full burn requirements through the power station and we had alternative supply, we could have solved it that way. But because the mine was, I mean, the power station was designed to receive coal from the mine, you had to look at the mine's solution as well. Besides just looking at the solution, there is a contractual and legal right where they've got a right it is contemplated in the contract to declare hardship. This is a 40-year agreement or 30-40 year agreement. And the 30-year, 40-year agreement sometimes cannot take all sort of future issues into account that can't be contemplated. And so these clauses are sometimes put into the agreement to allow any aggrieved party to uh, sort of come to the table for a different discussion. In this particular case, they came to the table and we assessed it. So maybe that gives some context as to why we had to step into trying to resolve this particular cold supply and cold supply agreement. Thanks. So the very first cold supply agreement was decided without knowing the price of uh, mining the coal, which was 280 at the time. No. Was it agreed without checking that? No, no, no. This coal supply agreement was a cost plus agreement before the 1990s. And in the 1990s, this coal supply agreement was converted to price agreement. And the fixed price agreement, um, in terms of the fixed price agreement, there was a coal supply to ESCOM, which effectively gave ESCOM a 10 million tons per annum coal supply for supply periods with options at an ESCOM sole option to extend the, the agreement. There was a base price that was agreed to back in 1990, and there was an escalation formula that was agreed to with ESCOM back in 1990. Now the ESCOM, the escalation formula back in 1990 assumed that the price of, of mining that coal will follow a certain trend. But if the actual trend is different from what you assume the escalation formula to be, then at some point, a party is going to be probably aggrieved. And at this point, what they were saying or their contention was that 
the escalation formula or the escalated price as agreed back in 1990 did not reflect the current reality in terms of what their mining cost of mining and operation was at this point in time. Now, I, I, I think perhaps other people heard you. Um, um, I didn't get clear on that part. There was a, a, my shock was there was an agreement for them to mine the coal with you paying them around 280 per ton. But then you took the price up to 550 per ton. Am I correct? That is correct. Yeah, 280 to 550. And but then the initial agreement was 280. And I do not understand what was the assessment, which then came to the determination that the contract between ESCOM and South 32 could be 280. And then they declare hardship, then the price is bumped immediately up to 580, which is almost double the price. And I don't know which market does that. Yeah, Honorable Mente, what happened back in the 1990s is that when this, when this mine was converted from a cost plus agreement to a fixed price agreement, it contemplated two things. The first thing is that it contemplated the coal supply that I, that I just elucidated to you. It then also contemplated um, back in the day, I think it was Rancol or Transmit, I can't remember exactly, but eventually BHP Bulletin. So it contemplated BHP Bulletin uh, selling coal on the export market. So over time, it, it, the, the cost of them mining coal, the, the, the export product was subsidizing the ESCOM product. When it got to now the later stages, the, the, uh, the now South 32 closed the export mine or the export uh, area, uh, section of the business saying it was too expensive. So, so now you didn't have an export product subsidizing the ESCOM product. So when you looked at the cost of mining the ESCOM product, it was higher than the price we were paying uh, to South 32. So that's why that's when they declared a hardship. And that's when our consultants went in and verified the financial distress. We didn't agree with the hardship as per the contract, which, which effectively states, you know, was there something that uh, like materially that changed over time that you didn't anticipate at the start of the contract? As an example, were there different environmental conditions or different legislation? Our consultants came back and said, we think they've probably mismanaged the mine more than there being a change of circumstances. That's why we didn't agree with the hardship clause. But from their view, they've got a hardship that they've declared and they disagreed with our view. The bottom line is that we can disagree how much we want, that's fine. The issue is our security of supply is going to be affected and how do we resolve that? And what's the best way to solve for that? Hence, we had to come to the table to see how we solve for this particular issue we have on the table. And we think, even though this is more expensive, absolutely, I mean, we, this was our cheapest coal contract in the system. We think this gives us some time to alleviate the security of supply risk that we that, that, that we um, potentially were facing. So with all the hardships that uh, South 32 have declared and your kind of a solution that has been provided through the report of your consultants, um, which then uh, was a confirmation or rather what persuaded you to take the price up to uh, 550 from 280, will South 32 not declare another hardship before 2024? Look, I mean, legally, legally, and, and in terms of the, the commercial um, laws available to any company in South Africa, they, uh, they, they, they can one contractually declare hardship, but they can also put themselves in business rescue or liquidation should the numbers or should the um, numbers not stack up. So, so really difficult to get a guaranteed coal supply or guaranteed cash from anybody uh, in this particular circumstance, especially if that 
counterparty is facing financial hardship in any event. So we have tried to put as many measures as possible in place to secure our supply, but the other parties have their own constitutional rights to do what's afforded to them, and I can't control that, unfortunately. Very well. That's exactly what I, I understand. That we cannot co co control or it's beyond our control what could be the outcome of their business. However, why do we then agree to long terms of contracts with people who don't have a stable market or stable business? Because if then South 32 is being paid and everything else is done according to 2024 and the transactions between ESCOM and South 32 um, are all paid off to South 32. And then they come and declare um, another hardship and they go under business ratio whatsoever, liquidation whatsoever, in a year or two from now. That's a loss to ESCOM. Why do we engage in long periods with people who have unstable business? Yeah, Honorable Nente, I, I don't think we engage with people who have unstable businesses. I think when, when you enter into these kind of big infrastructure projects, like if you're building a 50 year old, I mean, if you're building a power station with a 50 year life, you effectively want your 50 year sort of input material secured as well. Um, it gives you certainty, it gives you uh, price stability, and it gives you security of supply. It ensures that the, your 50 year power station asset is, uh, has the ability to run for 50 years. So, so with the best of intentions, you put these agreements in place, but along the line, certain life happens or certain events take place and one needs to consider them. And in this particular case, that's where we are right now. Now, if you look at the, the 280 rand per ton price, that is the cheapest coal supply in the entire ESCOM basket. So one needs to understand why are they the cheapest? Are they doing something fantastic? Or is it being subsidized by something else? And in this particular case, it's not that their operations were great. It was just that the pricing was sort of miscued. And, and in that case, something had to be done and something had to be fixed. But, but we've got many other uh, coal supply agreements and partnerships like that, which are proving very, very valuable and are extremely favorable to the country and to ESCOM. And if we can, uh, you know, I mean, if those relationships work. So I think this is, uh, it's, it's like, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are certain, I guess, relationships and certain uh, investments that work very well for you and some of them not so well. And I think this one has served us well for a very long time, but we had a point where now that that is not the, not the case and, and its end is in front. Okay, uh, my very last is that, how many reports did you uh, undertake or how many investigations did you then undertake uh, where this hardship issue was concerned? Because you are mentioning consultants, fine. Which uh, uh, investigation was where they engaged in the consultants? We, we, did, we did one investigation and the one investigation comprised of two parts. We did a hardship review which the consultant compiled, and then we did a, a commercial due diligence for the sale. And it's the same set of consultants that did both. The, the set of consultants were, that were appointed were POSWA Incorporated, it was a legal firm, and, that, and they sub, sort of further subcontracted the technical parts out to other entities. The financial part was, was done by Mazars. The, um, the, the, the technical investigation was done by Minscon, the environmental uh, investigation, the technical environmental investigation was done by uh, Globesite. Uh, the, we had an environmental uh, legal uh, uh, team on site that was Wiener attorneys. And those, uh, that, that team formed the, the due diligence team that did the hardship verification and the uh, commercial due diligence on this transaction but it was one investigation done at one point in time. 
And it's, it's a pretty in-depth investigation that took a few months to complete. And out of all these uh, investigations, none of the entities or companies indicated to you that um, South 32 management was the one actually mismanaging their own mind and therefore part of their hardship is their own, of their own doing. No, that is exactly what our consultants have said. So what I, what the feedback I gave you was I said, South 32 declared hardship. We disagreed with their hardship claim. So our consultants have, have disagreed with their claim for hardship and the reasons for their claim. But what our consultants have certainly agreed to is that there is financial distress at that mine. So there's a, there's a difference. They are loss making and, and they are bleeding cash as, as the investigation was being done. But the reasons contemplated for being in hardship, which South Korea to have put on the table, we as ESCOM completely disagreed with the findings of our, cons of our consultants. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I want to propose that, can we get um, the report of the consultants? And then we also satisfy ourselves that the determination to take the price up from 280 to 550 per ton was justifiable. And it was actually in line with how they should have dealt with the situation at the time. Uh, thank you, Chair. On this one, I have one last one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Honorable Minister, just one second, and then we'll proceed. Right. Um, on this slide, may I, I just want to draw our attention to the... Okay, so there's reasons for deviation, which is in blue, then the gray area. So I'm not in the gray area, the section at the bottom beginning on 30 March, 2021. Can everybody see that one? Yes. 30, on 30 March, right. <clears throat> on 30 March, 2021, National Treasury approved only a 24 month extension. And subject to an independent analysis, ready to choose cost structure. Right. Uh, that, um, uh, independent assessment analysis. Um, and if you haven't, why not? Because I think that is that is important um, because it gives us the kind of uh, assurance that we, 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 we need. So can we deal with that? And then on you can proceed to the next one. I'll come back to the S32 matters now, but I just want to get into that. Chair, do you want a response from me or National Treasury? I just want to confirm with you. A response from National Treasury. Um, thank you, Chairperson. It's Estelle Setan, uh, the Acting Chief Procurement Officer. We have not yet instituted that investigation. Um, after the application or the approval of the four-year extension at the 550 rand per ton um, uh, application that was that was approved um, we are in the process now of drafting the the terms of reference for that investigation so it will probably uh, be done in the in the next quarter Thank you, Chair. All right. Um, thank you, National Treasury. Uh, let's go to ABB, reference number 85. Um, I think it's important to mention that this very same ABB is part of the companies that were paid more than that was necessary for them to be paid at some point. Now, um, there's a deviation sent to National Treasury and the National Treasury says ESCOM should do a market analysis that includes all the accredited service providers and not only 
APP. So their reason for deviation was that APP is the preferred, preferred underlying service provider because of the existing engineering and maintenance knowledge based and experience at Quebec Nuclear Power Station. Uh, testing the market here is, is, is very correct. What level decided this particular decision? Who signed it to National Treasury? Escom, you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, and good afternoon, honorable members. Um, this is Ridwan Bakken uh, here from Escom Nuclear. So the uh, now I'll, uh, I'm going back to the uh, the question of who signed the original single source um, uh, request, and I'll I'll provide that. I'm just looking at at the the paperwork on that. But if I may just go to, to, to some background on it, if, if I am allowed to. Um, the, the, the reasoning for, for going single source in the first place was um, based on, on existing infrastructure at the, at the power station. So we, it was requested in July 2020. We received the response in, in, uh, in September of 2020 uh, requesting apologies. Uh, requesting additional um, that the application will only be considered after market analysis market analysis report is provided. Um, so after further analysis was done, it was we found that ABB is 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 uh, what what's considered to be the OEM um, in the ESCOM generation standard and also applied for other other power stations. Um, so if I may then go. Back to the now. I'm looking for the the, the documentation here, um, but it was signed through our, our the usual process, but assessed by the engineering um, personnel, the project team, and then um, the uh, also then by by, by the uh, the project management team. Um, and I'm just looking for the original single source check. And I'll be able to, to answer your question. So the single source was then signed off by the senior manager, uh, procurement and supply chain management uh, within the, the nuclear area. Um, and it went then went through the uh, the CPO for submission to to uh, National Treasury. Um, so, so Chair, that's the the sort of the, the, the route that we followed for 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 applying for this. Um, if I may give some more, more background, because it's uh, the, and the reason why the single source was requested, um, Kuberg aligned to, to the EDF uh, French power station in terms of the design of the plant. And um, we have uh, found that, and, and in correspondence with EDF, um, with the system becoming obsolete, which was notified to us by, by the supplier a number of years back, we inquired with EDF, um, the French nuclear power utility, what they have done with their system. And the indication was that uh, they moved to have moved to the ABB system. Um, and for for Kubo, the replacement strategy benefits and 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 promotes the internal use of resources because we have actually got a, a re existing infrastructure with the new uh, digital systems, um, our reactor uh, control rod protection system, which uses the same underlying architecture. And have uh, therefore also um, training materials, training facilities on site that, that uh, utilizes this architecture. So it's in, in existing infrastructure. Um, also, the what, because there is a, a level of, of proficiency on this architecture, um, we identified a potential 
cost saving of going this way of around about 69 million rand due to, to the use of internal experience gained from, from the protection replacement um, in doing that work. So the single source is therefore based on being able to use the, the existing internal resources and to, to standardize across the protection system for the plant. And also it helps with internal um, skills development and, and benefits in terms of using existing infrastructure trading simulators and the like that we have for and, and that for, for, for this particular architecture, the ABB based architecture. What we have also, so after the, 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 the uh, response from National Treasury um, and further analysis, it was confirmed that ABB is, is the OEM so as captured in the ESCOM generation standard and applied to, to other power stations. And this directed that the project team should apply to the, the ESCOM generation standard that supports the use of the OEM. Um, and, and also endorsed by the ESCOM Protection Study Committee. Um, so this process is still underway and uh, we will be submitting a report to National Treasury to, to inform them of the, um, the outcome of, of this uh, further analysis. And I must just also indicate that at the moment or at present, no commitments have been made. And I've actually asked that we do not make any commitments until we, we've uh, We've uh, spoken to National Treasury on the matter as well. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, are you there? I am. I thought you were proceeding. All right. No, I am proceeding. Okay. Um, in your response it looks like you are considering app as you are trying to tell us how they can cut the cost and all those things are you aware that abb is under investigation by special investigating unit uh, back to you escom are you aware that ABB is under investigation uh, by special investigating units. And that is um, um, emanating from a case of the very same ESCOM in malfeasance, fraud, and corruption. ESCOM? Thank you, Honourable Member. I, uh, we, we are aware of the, the broader ESCOM issue with, with ABB. Um, in terms of the, the, uh, the, the approach that we followed for, for how to, or the, the, the approach to um, procuring the, the, the service and the, 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 the technology to replace our, ex our obsolete existing equipment, um, we have followed the, the normal approach that we would follow in terms of assessing the, the suitable um, options in, in the market. Um, so uh, and, and uh, if it's something that, that we could certainly look at to see if there is any, any impact thereof on, in terms of this, but um, from a technological perspective or technology perspective and assessing the options in the market um, this is what the, the, the process has, has, has led us to. Um, and, and it's not so much about uh, the ABB option being less expensive from, from their side. It results in, in us being able to, to, to do a lot of the work internally because of existing infrastructure that, that already is based on the same architecture, which, which will allow us to do a lot of the work internally with our own engineering uh, teams and uh, benefit from training and experience that we have within our maintenance and operating teams as well on, on this similar type of equipment based on the same um, software and architecture. I don't think there can be any amount of justification to 
retain the services of a person who is involved in defrauding you. At some point, there were money that was paid to them without doing the services. Now there is a full-blown investigation into them. We'll get SIU to give us the report as to how far is that particular investigation, which um, I'm sure your CEO is in uh, uh, communication with the SIU with where this part is concerned. But I want to bring in the National Treasury and then want to know also from them, what's their perspective when it gets to such um, crude characters where now we get an entity of the state advocating to get people who are defrauding them, have been involved in, in malfeasance, yet they still stand a chance to be advocated for and get business with the very same entity that they have defrauded. Uh, a national treasury. Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, I think at a principal level, the, the, the first issue we had with this application before we get to the issue of the defrauding is the fact that um, ESCOM, um, and in, in, in their own information that they provided to National Treasury, um, and, and I think it makes sense, is that they want to run a plant that prevents um, um, uh, disturbances and, and damage and, uh, to the health of the plant um, and, and to prolong the, the, and prevent uh, repairs on the particular plant. Now, part of, 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 of getting those um, uh, outcomes is a proper planning of maintenance. And, and, and in this application in particular, ESCOM um, made an urgent application to replace a system that was obsolete. And we found it difficult that you, 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 you need to uh, uh, replace a system that is obsolete um, urgently. Uh, and it, it could not mean, it could only mean that um, you, you identified the urgency now. But then if you only identify the urgency now, then it means that there's a problem with um, the monitoring of the systems and the maintenance of the system in itself. Um, so from our perspective, we believe that um, this was poor planning from ESCOM side. ESCOM should have known of the um, obsolescence of the system and should have put uh, proper measures in place to make sure that they approach the market um, and look for uh, systems that would then um, replace the system again to ensure that there's prevention of disturbances, there's prevention of damage to health of the plant um, and to prevent prolonged repairs. Um, as a result, we then uh, 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 did not find it justifiable for the single source procurement. Um, and we, we then um, said ESCOM must then go out and test um, the market. Chairperson, at the time we were considering this application, we were not aware of the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the fraudulent um, allegations against the service provider. And the principle is um, when government does business with any service provider, um, it does um, that business with good faith. Um, and therefore government expects that any service provider does the same, retain the same principle and does the business in good faith. Um, as a result, it would not be um, uh, in the spirit of a public procurement and in the spirit of our constitution for any service provider um, to continue doing business or even for government to do, continue doing business with a service provider um, that is not doing it in good faith. Um, and in this case, I, I think the most appropriate thing would then be to investigate um, the allegations and, and, and ESCOM get to the bottom of the allegations, um, uh, Chairperson. But at a principal level, 
for the replacement of this system. ESCOM needs to test the market because the system is obsolete. Um, uh, it's obsolete and um, there could be systems in the market currently um, that have advanced with technology um, that could assist um, ESCOM in, in achieving their um, objectives, but um, it would seem with this application that they would like to continue with, with this particular uh, service provider, which we do not support, Chair. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, okay, before we proceed, uh, Honorable Mentor, can we uh, just get a um, uh, reaction from the SIU? If there are any at this point in on the issue that have been raised on the SIU. Good afternoon, Chairperson and Honourable Members. Um, <clears throat> yes, the SIU has investigated the ABB contract at the Kusile power station. Um, we have found that, that there was fraud and corruption um, that took place. Part of the evidence that, that was provided um, to the SIU, came, in fact, came from ABB, the company themselves, who provided quite a substantial amount of evidence um, to support the investigation, both of the SIU as well as the other law enforcement country, uh, apologies, law enforcement agencies in South Africa and abroad. So ultimately where we landed with this was that, um, firstly, we agree that in terms of the constitutional principles at play, that in instances where there is fraud and corruption, that we have no alternative but to apply for the setting aside of the contract at Kusile. However, there are certain matters that had to be taken into account from a technical perspective, as, also, as well as the, the, the perspective of the future supply of electricity to South Africa. Should we at this point, or should ESCOM at this point, disengage the, the uh, services of ABB? Um, included in, in, in that consideration are issues such as um, a lot of the, of the um, equipment that has been installed would have to be replaced um, because of the IP and, and other technical um, uh, considerations. That would, co and a cost was put to that. Um, if I can just confirm, in this instance, we did obtain a independent um, report from uh, uh, experts to determine what the implications would be should ABB at this point be removed from site at Kusile. And the reality is that um, the, when taking into account the cost to the country, um, which would be in the, to the tunes of billions, um, and apart from that, the fact that the completion of the Kusile power station will be put back by at least another two years, if I remember correctly. I'm speaking under correction because I don't have the report in front of me uh, of the experts. But this was all discussed um, with National Treasury. Uh, the SIU, as well as ESCOM, um, met with, with Treasury and explained the the. the issues at stake, and um, it was agreed with National Treasury that ESCOM can proceed to use ABB to conclude the contract, as the alternative to that would, would be extremely costly for the country to the tune of billions in additional expenditure, as well as, as I said, delay in electricity supply. So that is where we currently stand. From ABB's perspective, we calculated the overpayment, again, with the use of experts, and calculated a one point, approximately 1.6 billion rand overpayment. That amount was paid back by ABB to ESCOM in December 2020. And um, currently, there is a process ongoing to determine the way forward between now and finalization of the contract. Um, again, speaking under correction, but as far as I'm, I'm, I'm aware, the contract or the, the, the contract at Kusile is approximately 
I think it was 95% complete, as I so I speak under correction, uh, but it's, it's, it's at a very um, advanced stage of completion. Um, so that is where we currently stand from a, from a criminal um, perspective. The matter is with the NPA, um, great uh, progress has been made there and we're expecting um, arrests to take place soon in South Africa as well as in other countries where uh, those who were complicit um, are being prosecuted as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sayu. Honorable Mente. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, National Treasurer and SIU. Uh, Chair, with your indulgence, I think we must get the, the conclusive outcome from SIU. And um, the considerations of ABB from ESCOM as well as the directive and the guidance from National Treasury before we can close this particular case. As much as National Treasury has uh, rejected the request, but if we're going to leave it at this, it leaves them a room to say ABB stands a chance. And therefore every Jack and Jill that have defrauded the state can come back. Even those ones that we have dealt with in the border gate thing. You must remember that you are trying to set a precedence as well as dealing with the people who are involved in these kind of things. We haven't posed the question of who was supposed to have tested the market and ensure that we rid ourselves of these characters of ABB and others who are corrupt. We haven't gotten there. So I would request, Chair, that we take this to the next hearing as well with conclusive uh, information and outcomes with SIU and the guidance of um, National Treasury. Us as a committee, we must take into consideration what SIU is doing with the service providers of the Bait Bridge. And the same process should be the same, like it, it shouldn't change. Where we say a service provider has to pay back the money to the state, and therefore terminate contracts with those people. We must get conclusive reports on that. If then there are technicalities as SIU is indicating, let's get a full briefing of those technicalities and also get to be on the same boat and understanding as to what would be a way forward. But one thing we're not going to sit and agree on is to have fraudsters coming back and have business with the state. It's not going to happen. So, Chair, I want to uh, propose that, as well as the transaction of WBHO, because I just came into uh, realization that these documents, these letters that were sent in February, we need to go through them. If you remember, there was a time we received from National Treasury a zip folder with letters and um, requests and their responses thereof with their uh, template. WBHO has got quite a substantive um, a, a response and it's very critical that we take this, we take time to deal with this matter of WBHO. Can we also take it to the next um, hearing chair? Thank you. Good colleagues, are there any further comments on these issues? All right. Um, I think our dilemma is that, of course, we are not going to be able to start with expansions today um, because uh, I, I think we, I mean, one is one o'clock is almost here. But can we go back to the issue of the um, sentence meted out on the official on the other um, deviation we are dealing with? Because that was outstanding. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I think the uh, the sentence that I was referring to, uh, the disciplinary action was taken against the, the, the general manager who was responsible for the Camden, uh, uh, Mr. Chetia. Uh, chair uh, from uh, the, the CEO can also add on that is that uh, 
during then the confrontation uh, was informed that the individual then put uh, a grievance as well uh, against that uh, uh, hearing uh, chair. And then uh, in, in that process uh, was concluded and then the individual was moved from the, this project and the, the other project manager was uh, uh, appointed to, 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 to run with this uh, project at Camden and then the, that individual then uh, subsequently also left the uh, ESCOM chair. Oh, the famous line, people have left ESCOM. Chair, I have nothing more. <laughs> Chair? He has also left scope. Yeah, it's very famous. People make the wrong things and then they leave. And then nothing happens. Is it honorable from your here? Yes. No, I'm done, Honorable Somi. You're done? Yeah. So if you are done, uh, the chair has already indicated that uh, we are unfortunately, because of time, not going to get into any other matter. Uh, so we'll have to set reasonable time uh, for a further engagement with uh, ESCOM um, on the uh, matters that have been somewhat referred back to them for further information and detail, uh, and as well to look into matters that have to do with SIU and other uh, investigative uh, authorities, and uh, uh, as well to get into hard debit piece of work uh, at the same at the same time. That's what I think we need to look into in terms of time. Is a, uh, I, I don't know from our team, uh, what sort of days can we look at in the next, uh, in the next week or so? Dombi? So Samia, we'll have to check uh, the sorry, program please. as it stands. No, my, my network is giving me problems. I don't know why, uh, because it's usually when ESCOM loads sheds, that's when the problem is. But uh, we, we, are, we are free of uh, uh, load sheds. Sure so, so we can't blame ESCOM for that today. Sure <laughs> <come around. laughs> yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so this time around, it, it's not ESCO. All right, colleagues, I'm sure you, you got the responses there. Um, okay, can I can I therefore, colleagues, request that we uh, suspend the meeting here because the if if we start on expansions now, we're not going to make time, and of course, there's the outstanding um, deviations, uh, which we we still have to 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 deal with. But I think significant progress has been made, and I don't think time has been wasted um, today. It's very, very important that we drill into these matters, and I think the cooperation of um, the National Treasury and the SIU um, helps us to get the full perspective uh, of, of the issues. Um, so I'm not sure if the minister's back. If not, I'll hand over to the deputy. No, let me start with see if there are any concluding remarks on his part and then we'll go to the board and then we'll hand over to the minister or deputy minister and then we will conclude for today in that fashion so gco over to you thank you honorable chair i've got nothing further to add thank you for the opportunity of presenting the eskom report to scopa okay uh, thank you very much. Uh, Prof. Chaperson, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I think I have found this uh, interaction very insightful. Uh, what I would really appreciate from, uh, from Scopa is to put in writing a brief summary 
of the issues that were discussed here so that it's recorded properly to ESCOM and we are able to, to be given an opportunity, I think, to respond to these issues of details uh, as you, as uh, I think uh, Honorable Mente and yourself and your colleagues have been articulating. I think it would be useful. I would uh, agree with uh, one of your colleagues that I think we need to revisit uh, these matters because they are all in the interest of making a better ESCOM and a transformed ESCOM and an accountable ESCOM. So I think these are issues that, uh, you know, I, um, I can promise the committee that I would want to happen at ESCOM. Uh, uh, and I can speak uh, on behalf of my colleagues in the board that were interested in this sort of ac activities. But otherwise, I'm grateful that we had this meeting. Thank you. Uh, prof. Um, we, well, the recording can be made available to ESCOM uh, of this meeting and where there are questions and issues that would like to raise, they will follow. Um, and then um, when we meet, of course, for the other deviations, uh, I'm sure that we will have a, 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 greater, a greatly improved uh, interaction and then add that uh, Mamdulasha has of course agreed to the suspension of the meeting but she's still going to deal with the issue of the expansions and honorable Fanmin and an honorable heart have left to come back for the issues of the investigations amongst others but yeah so um prof we will be in touch accordingly and um we will communicate in good time as we have endeavored to do um so that uh, we, we we give each other ample a pre preparation time um, for a mutually agreeable date. So that is noted. Um, uh, who is here of the two minutes that we will be out. So if not deputy minister. All right, I'm assuming the Nugba, they are no longer present. Um, all right, let me um, then take this opportunity um, and thank you, Mr. Chairperson and your colleagues in the board um, and the CEO and the executives for appearing before us this morning. I, I, I want to really, really iterate, reiterate um, that at the heart of what may seem to be a pedantic outlook on the part of the committee on these issues of expansions and deviation is the trend which we have been observing, an undesirable desirable one, in fact, of the abuse of this process to circumvent due process and thorough process. And so we need to be ultimately fully convinced that there was no other recourse other than the application to national treasury for this export and expansion or deviation to be applied for so that calls on uh, building up greater um, functionality and efficiency um, on these matters and so um, CEO, as i was really pointing out to you as well is that we endeavor to point to these things which we observe as shortcomings with the view that the relevant authorities will institute corrective action um, and close the gaps uh, so that uh, these things do not fall through the cracks. So I hope that from that perspective, uh, at the very least, um, there will be some sort of movement uh, for, for, for all of us. Um, and um, yeah, there are issues that I still wanted to raise. I will come back in fact, uh, to the issues of S24, uh, amongst others at some point, um, because I don't think we have fully exhausted all those issues. Uh, National Treasury, the independent assessment, um, if you can work out the modalities and finalize those and uh, with immediate effect, 
um, do that and then you give us uh, quarterly briefings on that. Uh, we will work out it. My understanding is a very, we will work out the timelines uh, uh, to see what will work so that we can um, as well. On the issues of the, insofar as the invest the Semenya inquiry is concerned, as I said, we have noted that um, and we will be processing the normal cause of work um, of financial uh, management assessment and inquiry as a committee. So I would like to therefore thank everybody um, for, 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 for their participation uh, this morning and uh, wish you well. Uh, as complaints, don't load shed us, particularly now that we're all gonna be home more than anything else. Uh, we really, really are hoping that you fix those issues as well because they've got a material bearing one on the economy but also on the financial management of ESCOM because it triggers other expenses and other costs for ESCOM, uh, which um, just bleeds the entity. So the need to effectively and efficiently deal with load shedding um, is an apex priority um, for, for ESCOM and must receive the necessary due attention and ratification that it, 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 it requires. Um, it is not sustainable. Uh, I was uh, in my 20s when it started. I'm now in my 30s. Can you imagine other colleagues and other South Africans? It can't be a reality of life uh, that this is the case. So really, we, 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 that issue has to be looked at because, as I'm saying, the ramifications are for ESCOM and for the economy and the country. Um, so thank you very much, um, ESCOM. Uh, colleagues, once again, thanks for your participation, SIU, National Treasury, and to our foreverly uh, competent uh, support staff as well. Be safe out there as COVID uh, is very much alive. The meeting, colleagues, stands adjourned, and have a good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Long live the Chair. Hey, oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>